I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, if you're familiar with our series that we run here every week on this channel at this time, you'll know that we cover a wide range of subjects. And tonight we have a very special subject, one that we've never really dealt with before. It's a topic that I've been wanting to cover for literally years, but never really had the opportunity to cover it in a way I like to cover things, which is usually in uh, some re really in-depth detail, going through the matter in a, almost with a fine-tooth theological comb, you might say. And uh, so the topic today, and if you have any friends out there that uh, may uh, fall into this topic, uh, give them a call, have them tune in, or uh, get your VCR uh, recording the show or something, and show it to them later. But the topic is Seventh-day Adventism. We're going to go into this in some detail. We've got a series we're producing here. This is show number one on this topic. And I think it's going to be uh, very enlightening indeed because I, as far as I know, uh, not many people know a whole lot about this topic, the Seventh-day Adventists. They, they know a few general things like, well, don't they go to church on Saturday and stuff like that. But really, beyond that, almost complete ignorance reigns out there on what, what this particular group believes uh, teaches and, uh, and what they understand about the Bible. So uh, to produce this program, this series we're doing, I've got some very special guests with me in the studio today. And I want to take this opportunity right now to introduce them to you because uh, we went to some, at least I did, to get some good pains to get them down here. They're from up north in Pennsylvania. So they've come a long way to film this show down here in Texas. And I want to just uh, thank them for being with us today. Wallace and Carol Slattery. Wallace, it's great Hi. to have you here on the program. We're today. happy to be here. Carol, thank you very much for being here. It's just it's a joy to have you here. Uh, I've wanted you all here for a long time, as I was expressing to you before the, we even started taping. And uh, for our viewers' sake, uh, Wallace, I'd like to uh, have you just say a few things about yourself. Uh, and then, Carol, just uh, give a little you know, brief background history of yourselves and and uh, tie in Seventh-day Adventism with uh, what we're going to be talking about in this, this program coming up. We were both uh, born Seventh-day Adventists and devout Seventh-day Adventist families. Uh, we're basically Westerners. In fact, I was joking to my wife that we came down here from Pennsylvania to get our accent straightened out. <laughs> uh, but we grew up in Seventh-day Adventism. We attended Adventist high schools and colleges. Uh, Carol's family were both workers in the denomination. And in fact, I worked for them as a teacher and school principal for 10 years, starting in the early 1970s. And it was only in the middle to late 70s when my college roommate, Larry Bochel, who was an Adventist minister, left Adventism and came to visit us in California where he received a very chilly welcome from my devout Seventh-day Adventist wife, <laughs> that Larry began to ask me questions that I suddenly realized I could not answer about Seventh-day Adventism. Why were Ellen White the Adventist prophet? Why were her 
visions not coming true? Why were her prophecies not really seeming to pan out? Now, uh, now Ellen G. White. You're... She is the founder and the great prophetess of Seventh-day Adventism. We're going to have a lot to say about her tonight. I see. And in fact, let me just say at this moment for our viewers out there that uh, Wallace, my special guest here, has written this book. It's called Our Seventh-day Adventist False Prophets. A former insider speaks out. Now this is, in my opinion, the best book on the market right now on Seventh-day Adventism. I'm sure there's other books that are thicker or whatever, uh, but as far as what I've read now, that Wallace has read more than I have, so he, he might uh, say there's something else, and I'm sure he will during the course of this program. There's another book I think you mentioned earlier. I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but at, uh, at the time of this filming, uh, as far as something short, easy to read, easy to understand and comprehend, uh, this is the, the best book I've seen on Seventh-day Adventism. It's not going to bore you with a lot of theological stuff. It just gets, it's short and to the point. It gets right to the nitty-gritty of the whole matter. Now, uh, I got a plug in there for your book there, uh, Wallace, but I uh, w don't want to take the opportunity away from your wife, Carol, to say a few words also, uh, about your little bit about, about your background and so forth. Well, like Wally said, I was born into a Seventh Day Adventist family, and uh, I, all my life that's all I knew. And uh, not until he started checking into it did I even think that it, there might be a problem. I just automatically believed it, and it was just amazing when he brought some documentation and showed me that. There were some problems with, with Adventism. I got to spend some nights on the couch over there. <laughs> you mean you actually made Wallace sleep on the couch? Oh, yeah, sure. You mean uh, you were kind of one of those types that are uh, determined to, uh, well, I was, you've heard it before, I was born a Catholic, I'm going to die a Catholic. Or in this case, I was born a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm going to die a Seventh-day Adventist. And then he, he starts questioning some of the teachings and, and doctrine and so forth mm -hmm. of this organization, it obviously got you very upset. Yeah, I thought he was rebellious. I thought I had a rebellious husband on my hand. I didn't know what I was going to do with him. And so you so, uh, I, you rebuked him to the couch. Yeah, he, he landed on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did, he, uh, how did he get his way off the couch and back into your good graces? Well, he finally, <laughs> <laughs> he finally, I think, had enough courage to, well, he told me one day, he said, come in here, I want to tell you something. He said, I want to, uh, I have some things to tell you. He said, I'm not so sure how you're going to take them. So I immediately thought, well, he probably is going to tell me about some affair he's having or something. <laughs> I, me? <laughs> I, which seemed very <laughs> wild at the time. But um, he told me, he said he had some papers he wanted to show me. And the first thing he said was he was having trouble with Ellen G. White. The prophetess the of prophet the seventh. The one really that started it, along with her husband, James White, that started the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I think, in, what, 1861? Well, like I think that. it was incorporated in 1862 or 3, okay. but it had been a movement since the late 1840s. Okay, the Millerite movement. Well, we'll the get into all that. We'll get into that. Uh, so, anyway, you weren't, you weren't looking to attack Seventh-day Adventism or, or, or get out of it or anything. It was just that... Your husband here had some questions, he had some things he showed you, and you almost, uh, against your wills, came across this material, and, and what was it about some of the things he showed you that uh, started to take your mind uh, away from such devotion to Seventh-day Adventism to start having maybe some doubts about well, the whole thing? Well, he, he had a whole stack of papers, and he said that the papers had come from Walter Ray, the pastor from... Uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. Now, Walter Ray, now he's, I've got it right here. Uh, in fact, Wallace, why don't you say a little bit about this book and Walter Ray and then tie that into what uh, right. Carol was just well, telling us. Well, briefly, Walter Ray was a Seventh-day Adventist minister, <laughs> very, very involved with Ellen White. He believed her wholeheartedly. <laughs> but as it happened, he had turned out a commentary on her works, <laughs> which one Adventist family, in gratitude for the fine work he had done, gave her, uh, him a book out of Ellen White's library. Mm -hmm. When he went through this book, he suddenly discovered that a lot of the material mm -hmm. was, uh, of the, written by this other author were things that suddenly had shown up in Ellen White. And then he began doing research, and he found tremendous amounts from all kinds of Victorian religious writers 
had suddenly appeared in Ellen White's writings. And he realized that this woman had taken these writings for her own and had claimed that they had come straight from God. Uh, Walter Ray was stunned, angered, and he began publicizing what he was finding, and needless to say, it caused a tremendous commotion in Seventh-day Adventism. Ray worked, or lived, about 20 miles away from where I was teaching at that time. And I might say that things were so well hidden in the Adventist background and their history that he, although I had started having questions, as I said, in 1977, I had been spending summers working on an advanced degree. And meanwhile, in my spare time, I was also working, trying to f find out the truth about Ellen White, and I was getting nowhere. The facts about Ellen White were very well hidden. However, it seemed that all roads seemed to lead to Walter Ray. Mm -hmm. So, in August of 1980, I made an appointment to... Oh, and, then, and we have it on a monitor here. Here's Walter right, Ray's the book. Walter, the, the White Lie, which he had come out with and had so stunned the Adventist leaders. And that's the book where he documents... Uh, Tremendous amounts uh, of copying, uh, enormous amounts of uh, copying. Basically, just, just outright plagiarism from other authors. Legally, the Adventists have uh, made a case that he did not, that she did not plagiarize, that perhaps back then it was acceptable to do as far as the legal okay. requirements go. The problem is that that does not answer the ethical, moral, and theological questions, if it's all supposed to come straight from God and you found that it came from the suppositions from another divine, another mm -hmm. writer, you've got a serious problem then. Right, right. Um, and that was the problem Walter Ray found himself having with uh, Ellen That's correct. Watt. Anyway, well, I, went, I made an appointment, went over, saw Walter Ray, and came back with a stack of papers that just blew me out of the water. I was just stunned. And these are the materials that I shared with Carol the next day. Okay, so that's what you saw. You saw actual documented papers from the Ellen G. White estate, perhaps? Uh, no, uh, not from, from them. From, here would be comparisons, side by side. I think I, well, I have them later. I'll show them to okay. you. Uh, yeah, later well, it's on. a lot in this book, too. He, he shows yes, one book, amounts. and across the page you'll have Ellen G. White just uh, paraphrasing. Even to the point of illustrations, I think I can show these very quickly here. Oh, yeah, where she took the actual, even pictures. Here they are. For pictures example. out of one book and put it in her own book. Here is uh, one picture from um, the Great Controversy. Perhaps you can see it there. And here is uh, from the History of Protestantism, the same picture lifted. Okay, there it is. And there no credit monitor. given whatever. No credit at all, just taking the same photos. Mm -hmm. Even the uh, table of contents, the whole thing, just lifted. Huh. And no anyway, credit, I, showed no it to, given. I showed it to Carol, and she was just as, thank God, she was as stunned as I was, and she saw that we had a serious problem immediately. Mm -hmm. And so now the doubts were there. Right. And you got off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, and uh, through all this, uh, this led you eventually in a, just a... A continuing research of your own. That's correct. Even beyond what Walter Ray had given you? Adventism you might describe like um, peanut butter. It is hard to scrape off. It takes time, especially when it's been inculcated in you since infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I began having questions in 1977. I met with Walter Ray in the summer of 1980. And we finally left Adventism in the spring of 1984, which gives you an idea of a lot of the pain and soul searching we went through mm -hmm. before we ever resigned from this uh, organization. When, what year did you resign? 1984. 1984. Right. Man, and so during all this time, you did all this um, tremendous amount of research and lots you, of research, and, lots uh, of pain, and. Uh, it just seemed to get worse and worse. The more you researched, right. the, the worse the situation got. Well, for a while we thought that Adventism would accept the new findings that were coming out, many findings which we'll get into, not merely uh, copying, but major, major mistakes in her theology and her teaching, things that she had said that had never come true, that had never been true in the first place, mm -hmm. and yet supposedly had come straight from God. So many things. And the last thing to go finally was when Carol and I sat down in the spring of 83 and began going through... Uh, the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, organization in comparison with the church, I'm sorry, with the uh, Bible. Mm -hmm. And again, we were stunned. We, we found they just didn't hold up. See, mm -hmm. we thought what we would do was just, when we found out that Ellen White was a false prophet, 
that we would just be Seventh-day Adventists, but we would not pay any attention to Ellen White. We would be Evangelical Adventists. A new but term it doesn't work that way. Huh. The church closed its ranks and froze people like us out. Hundreds of workers and probably thousands of members were frozen out during that period. Now, uh, what... What years are you talking about this period? Right. Say, say, say 80 to maybe 83, 84. So this is the big purging, you might say? You might say it was a big purging. Now, how do they do it? How do they go about getting you out of the church? Well, in the first place, jobs suddenly became very scarce. So they were, they were getting people that would actually work for them right. and putting the financial squeeze to, by way of their job position. Uh, Walter Martin stated, uh, the famous uh, CRI leader, right. stated that he had a list of at least 200 Seventh-day Adventist workers who had been purged of their positions. I'm sure that it was much higher than that. Well, what did they do? Did you send you a notice in the mail saying, oh, by the well, way, your job... Well, suddenly my job started? no longer existed. Oh, okay. And uh, no other job existed. And uh, I got off easy compared to some of them. I know many were just outright fired and were given maybe a couple weeks severance and were out of a job. When you realize that Seventh-day Adventism is the highest paying denomination as far as the ministers go, you can see what a painful odyssey this might be for an Adventist minister. Uh, they're paid very well and the working conditions are comparatively good. You know, give a sermon once a week, conduct some meetings, things of this sort, and you're doing just fine. And suddenly to find out the facts, but realizing that you're trained for nothing but Seventh-day Adventist minister. A lot of ministers underwent a lot of pain at that time, I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah. And it's still going on. And, oh, and they're still purging out people. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and what is it that's going to get you purged? What, what, are, what do you have to do as a Seventh-day Adventist to have the hammer come down on your head? Is it just question LNG White? Is that all it That's takes? basically it. Mm -hmm. Whether you, you like it or not, she is the rock. She is the rock of the denomination. She's the cornerstone. And... That's where it revolves, that's where it started, and that's where it's going to end. So if you're in a church, let's say, at a, at a Sabbath school or something like that, I guess that's what they call it, they, they meet right. on mm -hmm. Sabbath school instead of Sunday school, right. uh, and you're in there and you just happen to mention off the cuff, you, you disagree with Ellen G. White on some doctrine, then they might have assumed that perhaps then the grapevine carries that to somebody right. else and they find out more about how you feel about the situation, and next thing you know... Uh, is there any kind of like, I know the Jehovah's Witnesses, they practice something called shunning, mm -hmm. where they, they, they start to kind of, you know, It's not as organized toward. in the Adventist church. They don't formally shun. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so. But you now, can kinda... it, it makes a difference if you're a worker in the church, mm -hmm. or if you're in the school system, or a worker, then mm -hmm. it makes a difference as to um, uh, what you believe. If you're just a church member, they may, they may uh, take a while. So they'll basically freeze you out. Okay. And so, we've had a lot of friends who've had that happen to them, I might add. Man, so sounds like they're playing for keeps on this situation. I know of other workers right now who are going through, undergoing the same process. It's, it's almost like a, a throwing a rock in the ocean. It takes time for that wave to spread, but it, as it goes through, it uh, takes the workers with them. I know of workers right now going so through this So what we're process. seeing right now is a, in <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventism is a, a more rigid polarization around Ellen G. White as a true prophetess and her interpretations as being almost uh, in, infallible. To use a good Western term, they've tended to circle the wagons. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, yeah, that's a good way to, to illustrate it, mm -hmm. for sure. Well, I just want to point out to our audience one more time, we've got these two excellent books up here on the chart, chart board. Uh, my special guest, Wallace Slattery's book, Our Seventh-day Adventist False Prophets, Former Inter Insider Speaks Out. We're going to, in this video series, get into a lot of material that you'll find in this book. And, of course, Walter Ray's The White Lie coming off of Ellen G. White, uh, kind of a takeoff on her name to put this, this title of this book, The White Lie, together. But uh, incredible documentation in both, mm -hmm. in both counts. So if you have a chance to, to, uh, to contact uh, either our ministry Wallace, uh, by the way, you have a ministry that someone might want to write. Yes, if uh, people are interested in our uh, book, they can uh, uh, contact us at uh, Stepping Stone Ministry, Box L1124 in Langhorn. That's L-A-N-G-H-O-R-N-E, Pennsylvania, 19047. And... Uh,
Okay. Get it right out to you. Very good. Or if you can't get get it that way or through us, uh, there's always a Christian bookstore. That's correct. A Christian it's bookstore. put out by uh, Presbyterian and Presbyterian and Reformed Press. Uh, very good. And so those are available one way or another. Right. Uh, so uh, please get your hands on that particular book if you uh, are very interested in this subject. It'll be of immense help to you. Now what we want to get into in this first part of our series on Seventh-day Adventism is more of the detail, going through with a fine theological comb, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast. And uh, basically I want to start first with a question that uh, has been, I think, pretty prominent in evangelical circles for a lot of years because there has been a big controversy, almost the great controversy. <laughs> that's a, if you understand some of Ellen G. White's books, that's kind of a bad joke. But anyway, <laughs> we'll get into that somewhere. But there's been a there's been some uh, controversy within uh, evangelical Christian circles about whether Seventh Day Adventism can be classified as a cult or not. Is it is it just a Christian denomination with a lot of aberrational teachings that aren't so serious, or is it a, a full fledged non-Christian cult like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses would be classified or Mormons or Reverend Moon's uh, Unification Church, something of those along those lines. And uh, to get us into this subject and try to answer that, that question, uh, I've got a chart here I want to go through. We've got some questions that pertain to what, what can be considered a, a theological tests for something to be considered a cult. And uh, looking at the, the chart here, we have uh, something called patterns in the cults, and then there's questions to ask in pertaining to these patterns that you commonly see in a lot of uh, cults, like well, we just mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, Unification Church, so forth. But uh, point one basically asks the question, does the religious group under consideration add to the Word of God through indispensable publications that claim to give the Bible's clear meaning or uh, through present-day direct revelation from God? So, uh, we, you know, do they add to the Word of God through their publications uh, that claim to give the Bible's clear meaning? You know, they're trying to really give you the, the straight and narrow. The, this is what the Bible really means when it says this. We have a lot to say about that one. Or do they or also, do they have some kind of present-day revelation like a prophet or something that says, well, God gave me this revelation and this is what it means. Uh, so that's one test of does it classify as a cult or not. Uh, number two... The question I ask is, does the examined group subtract from the person or finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? And uh, so keep, the, keep that in mind. Number three, does the sect under consideration multiply the requirements for salvation by making works a necessary condition for redemption or salvation? So you can go to heaven, basically. Do they add a lot of requirements that uh, you normally don't see straight, you know, right up in the Bible? But they add a bunch of other stuff. And number four here, does the religious group in question divide the loyalty of its members between God and itself and its leaders? Is devotion to the group a test of faith or its leaders? Is the organization a vehicle for salvation? In other words, do you have to be in this group to make it to heaven? Do you have to follow their leaders to have the true interpretation to make it to heaven, and, and so forth. Do you need this organization as the true vehicle to, to get to heaven? And uh, th those are uh, some good questions to keep in mind as we start to analyze the very question I start out with. Does Seventh-day Adventism qualify as a full-fledged cult? And uh, we're going to apply a lot of these questions to the Seventh-day Adventists and see if they fit the bill on some of these things. And I would like to say, just for the, some of you who don't really understand, you know, we all know the word cult is kind of a vague term. It's, uh, it just comes from the Latin word cultus, which simply means group. And so it's a, it is a vague term, but and what you have to do is feed some theological meaning into that word to give it, you know, some more connotation that it has generally. And for our purposes, uh, I'd like to say, uh, basically, that a cult in simplest terms, is like organized heresy. It's, uh, it's uh, a group, as the word cultus means in Latin, it's a group of people usually polarized around somebody's interpretation of the Scripture. But by polarizing around someone's interpretation of the Scripture, this group gets around either a, a person's interpretation or some organization's interpretation. But then what they do is they go beyond 
what the Bible clearly says. They usually uh, violate cardinal Christian doctrine somewhere along the line because instead of following straight forward what the Bible is teaching clearly, they leave that out basically and polarize around some organization or some infallible interpreter, let's say, and, uh, and, and go in that route. So that's how I'm going to define cult for our purposes uh, as we move through it. Now keep these questions in mind, and we hope this series will start to answer the question, does Seventh-day Adventism qualify as a cult uh, when it comes to how uh, evangelical Christians would view it? Okay, now, with that said, I'm going to move on to our next chart. And... Uh, I'm going to let Wallace do a lot of talking here in just a moment. Uh, basically, if our camera can come in on this, I want to uh, show a couple of things, then I'm going to let uh, Wallace expound on it for us. Basically, on the chart here, we have a, a photograph, and over the top I've got the spirit of prophecy and her husband. And basically down here, we have uh, the co-founders of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen G. White and husband James White. There's James and there's Ellen G. White, supposedly the spirit of prophecy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Wallace expound on that in just a second, but I also want him to expound after he does that on what I have on the lower part of the chart. We have another photograph here of a, of a man named Hiram, Hiram Edson, who was out of the Millerite movement of the early... 1840s and so forth. I'm going to let you expound on that too. I'm going to let you just get into a, a broad history of this whole situation. And he came up with a famous doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventists called the Sanctuary Theory. And uh, it's expounded right here on the other side in a small print that we'll get into. But I want, to have, I want to have Wallace now start back up here with the spirit of prophecy, kind of give us a, a general overview of the history uh, and, and different things, and then moving into this Hiram Edson down here with the sanctuary theory. Sure. Millerism is the beginning of Seventh-day Adventism. William Miller was a farmer, a devout person, who uh, in the early, probably 1820s, decided that the Bible prophecies pointed to the uh, period of 1843 to 1844, that the sanctuary would be cleansed in his interpretation the world, that Christ would come and the world would be cleansed to become, you know, a beautiful heavenly place. He began preaching this in the 18, late 1820s, the 1830s, and the movement really seemed to catch fire. Now, this would be the middle Atlantic states and the New England states. Uh, the results were that perhaps a million people uh, joined Millerism toward the last part of 1843, getting ready for Jesus to come. First they thought it might be March of 1844 when nothing happened then. William Miller allowed himself to be swayed by the teachings of a man named Snow, a rather strange character who rode around in long garb of robes claiming he was Elijah the prophet. <laughs> and uh, where Snow took the chronology of an obscure Hebrew, Hebrew group called the Karaites that uh, Christ would come in October 22 of 1844. There was a lot of fanaticism involved with uh, this early Advent movement. Adventists don't like to talk about that. They have always taught that these were these sober Sunday school attending, God-fearing people who sat around reading their Bibles. Actually, the history is very plain that these were wild-eyed fanatics in any way you want to call they, it. They, hours they, upon hours of marching, marching, dancing, rolling leaping. on the floor, dancing, uh, practicing the holy kiss. Uh, are, are you are you saying it looks sort of like a uh, Benny Hinn uh, uh, healing revival? Or? Uh, just for starters, uh, they also even had the holy laugh. I mean, we're talking about some really wild stuff going on at that time. Okay. Uh, in the now, they came up with this date, 1844, October 22nd, uh, based on a false analogy. Uh, uh, the chronology of 2,300 years. They of thought Daniel that from the time that. Jerusalem would be rebuilt in 18 in 457 BC. 2300 days would extend on down with a day for a year to eight, mm -hmm. uh, to 1844. And as I said, they took the chronology of the Karaites, where they said, well, it's going to be in October 22. The people did have, and again, this is contrary to much Adventist history. They did sew for themselves white ascension robes that night. They stood on their housetops on 
hills around there, these people were so devout, they had sold their belongings, they had sold their homes, their farms, and they sat up all night waiting for Jesus to come. The effects of this, as you can imagine, were tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, it is well documented that a lot of people entered insane asylums immediately afterwards. Uh, Ellen White herself said that the sound of weeping was just almost universal. People couldn't believe it. Afterwards, um, William Miller said, I, am, I was wrong. He basically disassociated himself with any kind of movement, Adventist movement of this kind. The Adventists themselves, those who stayed with it, and as you can imagine, many people left it, divided into two groups. One was called the Open Door Adventists. These people continued to set dates that Christ would come. And they still exist. I believe there are several thousand adherents up there in the New England area Despite today. the Matthew 24 passage that says correct. no man knows the day or the hour. That's right. Mm -hmm. However, uh, others, began, uh, a few dozen began what they called the shut door movement. They looked at the story of the, brides, uh, the bridesmaids and the bridegroom where the door was shut. And they said, well, somehow or another, probation has closed. No more sinners can be saved. Now, one of the adherents of this was a young 17-year-old girl named Ellen Harmon. Okay, that's on our chart. That's right her right there. That's the girl. She had been badly injured by a, a stone thrown to her head many or a number of years before, when she was nine years old, had always suffered from severe health, uh, health problems up to this time. But now she began having visions. Her first vision confirmed the shut door belief. Probation is closed. No more sinners can be saved. Only the few dozen people who adhered to the shut door movement can be saved. Mm -hmm. um, well, of course, that didn't happen. People, babies were born, people wanted to join the movement, marriages occurred where the, the married person wanted to join it, time went on, Christ didn't come. So um, they wondered what could be going on here then. Well, I know that for many years Adventism taught that it was Hiram Midson having a vision. He's on our chart down He's below. on the chart down here. In the cornfield, in which he saw Christ entering the, from the holy place in heaven, as if there was a temple in heaven, just like the old Jewish um, t temple, mm -hmm. into the most holy. However, today we know that actually, or contemporary scholarship knows, that it was actually begun by a man named Orl R O R L <laughs> Crozier, who began some theological speculation that actually Christ had entered the most holy place and was offering a, a final atonement for the sins of the world. Now, Crozier gave up on this belief. He renounced it later on. However, it was adopted by the Young Movement, and uh, this is the beginning of the 1844 movement in, with the, within the Adventism uh, Church, which teaches that um, in 1844, Christ entered from the holy place into the most holy place and is up there offering in heaven, offering a final um, investigative judgment. They are going through the books, deciding who uh, belongs in heaven and who does not. And uh, instead of, in other words, the final atonement having been offered in the cross, as Christianity has always taught, that it is still going on in the um, courts of heaven today. Um, I might add that this 1844 belief is the only truly unique belief of Seventh-day Adventism. All other so-called unique doctrines are held by some other sect or cult somewhere. Right. But this all goes back to uh, that, the, well, everyone thought it was Hiram Edson. And now That's right. It, it, it really goes back to this other, this other guy, and I guess it wasn't out in a cornfield either. No, it was just theological <laughs> supposition he wrote up. I believe it was a paper called The Day Star. Uh, I see. Which this came. And uh, Ellen G. White just picked up on it. They, she picked up on it. It was confirmed soon, perhaps by vision. I might add that the shut door vision was never renounced. God ever, never, evidently never saw fit to inform her that she was wrong uh, with her I first see. vision. And uh, as far as you know, well, that was, what is that, about 140, 50 years ago. This would be uh, the late, middle to late 1840s. So uh, surely they don't hold this, uh, this, uh, this, theological speculation anymore about the investigative judgment. Oh, yes, they do. The shut door has been allowed to lapse. In fact, for over a hundred years, Adventism denied that it uh, had ever taken place, or that Ellen White, I should say, had confirmed this with vision. Mm -hmm. Well, it was only in the 1970s they found a letter of hers, as well as other writings of the period, which showed that she had confirmed it with vision. Mm -hmm. And But well, yes, they, they teach that how today. How do they deal with that? The, if if she's confirmed the shut... 
they, if she's confirmed with the vision, the shut door, that no one gets saved after, what, 1844 or whatever it right. was. No one's saved. I mean, anyone <clears throat> born after that, you're, you're lost and going to hell. Uh, and they say she's a prophet. Uh, how do they deal with that? Do they just for, try to sweep it under the rug or something? Well, let's put it like this. I would say that 99% of Seventh-day Adventists had no idea this had ever occurred. Believe me, they don't want it out. Uh, the typical reaction of a Seventh-day Adventist to finding this out is that of being stunned. Oh, really? Yes. The White Estate, which is the guardian of the Ellen White books, has equivocated, uh, you might say, played all kinds of word games with it, etc. Uh, I have a, a pamphlet which I quote in my uh, book uh, from 1980, in which they said that Ellen White misinterpreted the vision that she correct. Would you like me to read the uh, passage? If you've got it, go ahead. Yes, I do. That's what we're here for. Get into. Uh... This is from the book uh, 101 Questions on uh, Ellen White and the Sanctuary, and here here it is uh, from the pamphlet. Ellen misinterpreted this vision. She correctly, correctly understood that the day of salvation for the latter two groups, those who had either rejected or eventually met, left the Millerites, was passed. For them, the door was shut. But she incorrectly concluded that no one could accept Christ after October 22, that only the little flock remaining in the household of faith would be saved, and that everyone else would be lost. Now, this is very interesting, isn't it? Please notice that Ellen misinterpreted the vision think about it. In uh, 1 Peter 1, or 2 Peter 1.20, the Bible clearly states that the true prophet of God never interprets his visions. Ellen not only interpreted her visions, she misinterpreted her vision. <laughs> uh, I've also heard Robert Olson state that and God, he? Robert Olson, is the, has been the head of the White Estate. His explanation was that God deceived the group. God deceived the group? Yes. Now, to me, that's the mark of a I'd true fanatic. I'd rather blame God. Blame God. God. <laughs> so, so well, what it looks like to me is uh, there's actually some outright uh, suppression of information being... Uh, it has been. There's been a great deal of deceit. F.D. Nichols wrote a book called Ellen White and Her Critics in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. The man had access to and knew of that 1847 letter. I have a copy of it. Would you like to see it? Yeah, go ahead. Here it is. These are statements written first by James White in 1847. Can you focus in on that? Let's see what we got here. James White in 18... Now, this, this is, is 1847. This is this Ellen G. Is White's husband. husband. He writes, When she received her first vision, December 1844... She and all the band in Portland, Maine, where her parents then resided, had given up the midnight cry and shut door. They had given up on it. As being in the past, it was then that the Lord shew her in vision the error into which she and the band in Portland had fallen. She then related her vision to the band, and about sixty confessed her error and acknowledged their seventh-month experience to be the work of God. In other words, they had been wrong when they had given up on the shut door. Now, here is Ellen White writing to Joseph Bates, another seventh early Adventist leader. Mm -hmm. In 1847, the view about the bridegroom's coming I had about the middle of February, 1845, while in Exeter, Maine, in meeting with Israel Damon, about whom I'll have a lot to say later, uh, James and many others, many of them did not believe in a shut door. I suffered much at the commencement of the meeting. Unbelief seemed to be on every hand. There was one sister there that was called very spiritual. This is, incidentally, a rival, to, an early rival to Ellen White's visions. Mm -hmm. uh, sister Durbin. She had been truly a mother of Israel, but a division had risen in the band on the shut door. She had great sympathy and could not believe the door was shut. I had known nothing of their difference. Sister Durbin got up to talk. I felt very sad. Going on the next page. Next page, next page. At length, my soul seemed to be in agony, and while she was talking, I fell from my chair to the floor. This was Ellen's first vision. It was then I had a view of Jesus rising from his mediatorial throne and going to the holiest as bridegroom to receive his kingdom. They were all deeply interested in the view. They all said it was entirely new to them. The Lord worked in 
mighty power, setting the truth home to their hearts. Sister Durbin knew what the power of the Lord was, for she had felt it many times. And in a short time after I fell, she was struck down and fell to the floor, crying to God for, to have mercy on her. When I came out of the vision, my ears were saluted with Sister Durbin singing and shouting with a loud voice. Most of them received the vision and were settled upon the shut door. Notice, her vision confirms the shut door. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1884, this is what she says. And please notice that. The statements say that her vision corrected her error and made her give up disbelieving the shut door doctrine. But look what she says in 1884. For a time after the disappointment in 1844, I did hold in common with the Advent body that the door of mercy was then forever closed to the world. This position was taken before my first vision was given me. It was the light given me of God that corrected our error and enabled us to see the true position. She's saying just the opposite. Man, that's that's pretty heavy duty stuff. And there. Pe people want to believe she never she never changed made a her mistake, position, never changed a position or, or anything mm -hmm. else. Uh, so basically, the the shut door is uh, something that uh, mainly the hierarchy of the Seventh-day Adventist Church know about, but the, the little guys, they are not given access to this information. Interestingly, and I happen to know this from first-hand knowledge, mm -hmm. nearly all of the leaders of the Advent Adventist movement up until a few years ago had no idea of this. But there mm -hmm. were always a few people on the inside who knew about this. Mm -hmm. F.D. Nichols, I mentioned a few minutes ago, knew about this. He knew about this letter. Mm -hmm. Uh, Arthur White, Ellen White's great-grandson, just grandson, not great-grandson, <laughs> uh, knew about this letter and was very careful to keep this thing hidden. It was people who were unsympathetic to this position who managed to sneak this out and get it out into the open. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I have a copy of the original autograph of her letter. Man. It says the same thing. <laughs> so it's, it's there, it's available, and they've got that locked up in the vault. I they guess. did. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting thing if... Uh, you know, it just makes sense to me that if a, if a person's a uh, prophet of God and what they write are oracles of God, revelations from God, why lock up a lot of things in a vault somewhere where people can't see it? Why not put it out on display, maybe in a museum, and have it all where people can come by by the thousands every day and look at everything and see all these oracle manuscripts from God? You know, why lock it up? Where in in suppress things and not let people see what supposedly was given by God. The White Estate has been very very secretive up until the last few years. In fact, as of I believe it was 1982 or 83, they admitted that approximately one third of the writings of Ellen White were still not available for the public to see. One third. Approximately one third. Now I believe <laughs> since then there has been a great deal more openness because let's mm -hmm. face it after the. The cow's out, there's not much sense in keeping the barn door closed. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm still not positive that everything has been released. Man, that's, a, that's an uh, amazing thing. And I'm sure what you've just said here has been uh, already kind of a, a blockbuster for a lot of Seventh-day Adventists that uh, may have never known this information was here. And, uh, of course, now, how is a standard Seventh-day Adventist little guy going to get this kind of information? I mean... We know he's not going to trust us right now if he's watching this show. He's going to think, well, these guys are out to get us, you know. <laughs> and uh, But now, what if he were in there in the Seventh-day Adventist church and he wants to go do some research on his own to try to find out what you just said and what you were showing is really true or not? How's he going to do it? Perhaps the simplest way, of course, is to uh, get a copy of my book where I have a lot of the... Um writing in there okay. uh, also the but what if he doesn't trust your book sure. and he wants to try to get the primary documentation some other way he can contact the white estate directly and ask for a copy of their manuscript of uh, all the documents on the shut door they do put it out oh they do and okay so he can't get his, recently again he can get his hands on it yes he can through his own organization without depending on us so, right so these things can be verified beyond our, what we're saying here. He can also contact them for a copy of the 101 questions that I mentioned. I believe the quote I gave is from page 49. Okay, okay. And, of course, this always, again, raises the question. You know, one of the tests of a Bible is found in Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 and 22. Right. Which, uh, of a Bible says, prophet. Of a Bible prophet, yes. which says that if a person 
or a prophet claims to be a prophet and says something, and it turns out not to be so, mm -hmm. then pay no attention to him. In fact, don't even respect him. Right. And here we have a case. You can't say that it was a conditional prophecy because supposedly it already had happened. You know, uh, in uh, the fall of 1844, probation had closed. No more sinners would be saved. A very flat-out blanket statement of the period. And she was wrong. And wrong very early in her ministry. That's right. Right off the bat, almost. Over a period of years, uh, she seems to have become... We suspect she may have become discredited because of this. People began to realize her vision was wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, there is a period from about 1851 to 1855 in which it's called the uh, silent period. She really doesn't seem to have turned out any writings of this period or have been very active, and our suspicion is that that is the reason. I see. But then uh, over the sands of time and people start to forget things, you right. can start, uh, start up again. <laughs> well, as I said then, for many years they did deny that this was happening. Right. Okay. Well. That was a fascinating discourse, and uh, it's amazing what you can get out of a couple of pictures on a chart board. Huh? Right, yeah. <laughs> well, let me uh, take, the, take this down here and go on to our next chart and uh, take a look at, just for a lot of viewers who don't know a thing about Seventh-day Adventism, uh, just a brief overview, you might say, on just some of the distinctive doctrines, although you'd already mentioned that some of these... Uh, other than the uh, sanctuary doctrine and uh, investigative judgment that you mentioned a minute ago, all these can be found in other groups, other cults, whatever. That That's correct. Out there, but uh, Wallace, why don't you take a, a summary survey of these uh, these teachings of the uh, Seventh Day Adventists? Seventh Day Adventists keep the Sabbath very similar to the way it is offered in the Old Testament. That is, from Friday night sa uh, until Saturday night, both times about sundown. Uh, many non-religious activities are disallowed. Uh, they don't want you listening to secular programs, watching TV, uh, carrying on your vocation, uh, anything that basically is fun, <laughs> except perhaps eating, is disallowed. Uh, they're very strict on this. Now, why is that so important? Well, because they believe that the Ten Commandments of God are still um, binding. You know, are still binding and that they, uh, we are to keep them in the modern world. And of course that includes the fourth commandment which states that uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, etc. The seventh day. So uh, what, what, if, what if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and after a couple of years you just say, well, I don't really feel like keeping a Sabbath. <laughs> what are, is there any consequences? Well, yes. Um, it, it is certainly grounds for dismissal from the organization. Okay, so you can get kicked out if you don't That's it. go to church on... That's right. So, now, I've often heard, uh, maybe you can clarify this, what about this Mark of the Beast thing? What are, where do they get that from? I've heard, clarify this for me, because I've never really heard anyone really define this thing. I've often heard that, well, Seventh-day Adventists say you've got the Mark of the Beast if you go to church other than on the Sabbath or something like that. What, can you expound and clarify that? The, well, in the Revelation... It mentions the mark of the beast. And to Seventh-day Adventists, the mark of the beast, which they used to be very heavy on, and they still are if you really get into their theology, mm -hmm. is keeping Sunday instead of Sabbath for the Sabbath. And incidentally, and we'll get into this under prophecy here, mm -hmm. they teach that in the last days there will be a worldwide law passed that everyone is to keep Sunday for the Sabbath. And incidentally, that marks, again, the close of probation. They're going to give it another shot. Mm -hmm. I might add that only the Seventh-day Adventists and the Mormons teach that there is a close of probation bef some time before uh, the end of the world. I see. All right. Uh, you clarified that one for me. Okay, uh, Wallace, why don't you continue here with some Well, of briefly going on, they also teach that the Old Testament uh, dietary laws uh, are still to be adhered to. No pork eating, very similar to the Jews, although not kosher per se. Mm -hmm. uh, no pork, uh, no catfish, uh, no shellfish. No shellfish. Uh, the interesting thing is, again, that all the time that Ellen White was telling others that not only was she not eating these non-acceptable meats, but in fact that she was vegetarian, uh, we have in good proof that, or good evidence that she was eating, among other things, pork sandwiches, and she loved oysters. You know, she was born on the seacoast of Maine. Right. And we actually have a letter from her in 1885 where she told her daughter that, to send her some good uh, oysters, among other things. <laughs> now, uh, now, these doctrines like this vegetarianism, these dietary laws, the Sabbath... They do so teach forth, vegetarianism, too. Uh, uh, 
the, is this coming basically from Ellen G. White and her interpretation? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and she makes very strong statements about this. And, uh, okay. And many, most Adventists are at least uh, kosher, I'm uh, not kosher, but they will not eat the pork, et cetera, the shellfish, and so forth. Do they tie that in uh, with health concerns? Oh, anything? yes. It's very much part of, the, I would say, the sanctification of most Seventh-day Adventists. But the thing is, they Adventists. make that a test of fellowship. It is a test of fellowship. Oh, it's a test of fellowship. Oh, yes, definitely. So, uh, so if you make the mistake of eating pork or something like that... You can get caught. <laughs> <laughs> I might add that the other things include, uh, they're very strongly against uh, caffeine, such as coffee or Coca-Cola. Um, uh, very, very, very strongly against alcohol, etc., which is all quite acceptable uh, as far as they're concerned. They do not want you using alcoholic beverages. Right. The atonement of the sanctuary, uh, Larry, we already right. mentioned Right, we already went the investigative judgment right. and uh, the guy and all that Adventism stuff. Adventism tends to divide into two groups when it comes to the study of redemption. Uh, the left wing is pretty close to evangelical Christianity. They believe that you accept Jesus Christ, your salvation comes strictly from your acceptance of Jesus, mm -hmm. and that um, you um, th that sanctification is merely the things you do as a Christian. Mm -hmm. The right wing is much more traditional, and they believe that, yes, when you accept Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven to that point. The rest of your life you will spend working toward perfection, because in the last days, you must be perfect. In fact, Carol has an amazing a couple of statements from Ellen White I'd really like her to bring out at this time. Okay, uh, we've got less than five minutes left in this program, so if she can do that, and then uh, we'll have to race through these, these remaining ones and then maybe pick up with it right. in the next program. These are two statements from Ellen White, which will just probably even blow the minds of most Seventh-day Adventists, although Carol and I were both taught this as youth, that this is the way it's going to be. Mm. Here's one. Those who are, these are both from Ellen White. Those who are living upon mm. the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of the holy God without a mediator. You are to stand there without the intercession of Christ. No mediator. No, no washing of our blood What is that Christ. passage in Titus, I think, it says that there's uh, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Yeah. But they forget that verse. They do. This is Ellen White. Okay. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. That's Great Controversy, page 425. And here's the other statement. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Great Controversy, page 614. No intercessor. That's right. This takes Christ out of the picture completely. That, that's a mind blower. <laughs> I mean... Uh, I believe I might have the statement with me. If I don't, I don't. Uh, I'll show it to you in our next program. Okay, so Ellen G. White actually, uh, I mean, at this point, uh, what you were just talking about, she gets it down to where she takes the Savior, Jesus, out of the way so that you yourself kind of become your own Savior. That's correct. And, uh, by doing your own diligent efforts and doing your works. You have to be perfect in that time. Almost like sinless perfectionism. You have to be perfect. Does anyone teach that? The, the Adventists do. Yes, they do. Sinless perfection. In fact, in California, uh, the Ontario Church at that time was under the um, administration of a very perfectionistic pastor. Mm -hmm. He called in a right-wing Adventist organization called A Better Way. And twice in a meeting, a church board meeting, I heard the leader of The Better Way state that he had not sinned for two years. The purpose of the entire program, A Better Way, was to teach people to live perfect lives. Perfect lives. And you can imagine the paranoia and <laughs> depression and other problems. Well, you know, when I hear a man say he hadn't sinned in two years, I know the best way to get to the heart of the matter is if the man is married, go ask his wife <laughs> if he hasn't sinned in two years. Now, that's the fastest way to find out if he's telling the truth or not. <laughs> well, he, he was bragging about the fact, so wouldn't that be conceit? Isn't conceit a sin? Oh, well, I've always said, I think it's scriptural here, that uh, when a man thinks he can pull himself up by his own bootstraps for salvation, it, it leads to incredible conceit and pride and arrogance in that uh, you think, oh, I'm doing these good works and I'm not sinning and I'm, you know, I, I'm going to get the job done and look how good I've been this week. It just mm -hmm. it, it, it destroys any humility you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't be anything. When you look at the Scripture and how it shows us for what we really are, that we're just lost sinners 
And there's nothing, there's no merit in ourselves that are going to make us righteous before a holy God. Uh, it brings you down to the lowest, almost like to, to the worm level, you know, and you just realize you need a Savior. There's nothing you yourself can do by yourself. Oh, by the way, before you go on, Wallace, I'm getting a signal from our crew here that we're virtually out of time. We've just got a few seconds left, and I would, uh, we'll just pick up where we left off in the next show, so I want our viewers out there to, to stay tuned in this series. This is only part one of um, several shows we're going to do on this subject. Uh, but Wallace, but just take, take about 20 seconds and just give us a summary statement as we sign off. Seventh-day Adventism has been teaching its, uh, its teachings for the last 140 years. Uh, it has not been challenged by evangelical Christianity until the next few, last few years. And I would say to the Adventist believer, listen to us, do your own checking. You have a lot that was very exciting and is so much a better life than you can have possibly under Seventh-day Adventism. Okay, very well said. Uh, please join us again next week at the same time as we continue in this uh, very fascinating topic of Seventh-day Adventism. God bless. Thank you for joining us. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. and thank you for joining us today. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being here for this special broadcast on the topic Seventh-day Adventism. Now, you normally don't hear much about that topic. I know, because uh, I've been around for quite a few years, and I haven't heard much about it myself, and I thought it was about time that uh, if no one else was going to do it, our program would do it. And so we're here in this very special series uh, covering the topic of Seventh-day Adventism. What do they believe? What do they teach? Uh, all the different aspects and ramifications of that particular religion. And to help me expound on this topic, and I think almost in a, uh, in a, in a very scholarly way, is a very special guest from Pennsylvania. He's an author. He's authored the book, which uh, I happen to have a copy right here, called Are Seventh-day Adventists False Prophets? A former insider speaks out, Wallace D. Slattery, author. Uh, this, in my opinion, is one of the best books available right now on the market on uh, the teachings and doctrines of 
uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And I recommend that you get it at your Christian bookstore or uh, through our ministry or through Wallace's ministry. Is you, I will now introduce him and give, you a, give him a chance to give a little background information on himself and his uh, beautiful wife and also his mailing address for his ministry. So, Wallace, I want to thank you again for being with us in this series. Uh, you're on camera. Uh, you'd like to say hello to our audience and also give a little background information about yourself. We're very happy to be back with you people today. Um, Carol and I were Seventh-day Adventists all our lives until we left a few years ago in 1984. We have done a tremendous amount of research trying to find out the facts about Adventism, what it really is, whether it is even whether it is truly Christian or not. And uh, if you would like to contact us about uh, our book, you can contact us through Stepping Stones Ministry at Box L1124, Langhorne, Pennsylvania, 19047. Oh, very good, Wallace. And uh, Carol, would you like to say a few words? You were on last week, and uh, there were some new viewers this week that uh, didn't catch probably show number one. And uh, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Well, I'm happy to be here, and I'm also from an Adventist family. I grew up in an Adventist family. Mm -hmm. I was an Adventist all my life, and not until Wally did some research did we find out that there were problems in the church, and that's why we're here today. Okay, very good. Well, uh, our viewers out there, hopefully you caught part one of this series. It was uh, highly enlightening uh, if you were able to see it. Uh, uh, Wallace here did an outstanding job getting into the early, hurt, uh, early history of the church and, and a lot of uh, unknown teachings that uh, seem to have been suppressed over the years. I'll keep you in a little suspense on what those things were and hope that uh, you catch a rerun of that or uh, maybe uh, contact our ministries to find out more about th that particular show. But since there is a limited amount of time, uh, we want to cover as much new material as we possibly can in the time we have available to us. So in this particular show, we won't be covering uh, very much of what we covered previously. And we will continue to move into new, uh, new territory as we explore together uh, the uh, vast panorama of Seventh-day Adventism, uh, its prophet and uh, their, their doctrines and understandings of Scripture. Uh, well, basically what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to Wallace for a moment here uh, to give us just a very brief synopsis, a uh, recap to kind of bring us back to where we were, where we ended last week, so we can pick up there and move on. Uh, Wallace, we've got these charts we showed last week. This is just for our new viewers, just briefly. We're not going to get into any kind of detail like we did last time. But if you could explain for our viewers here about the spirit of prophecy, the, the people here in, in uh, this uh, picture, and then maybe uh, Hiram Edson down here in the Millerite thing, and then we'll, we'll try to get back to where we were from last week. Certainly. This picture is of Ellen White, uh, the founder and, shall we say, the guiding spirit of Seventh-day Adventism, with her husband James White, also very prominent in the early movement of Seventh-day Adventism. Adventism rose out of the Millerite movement, of the 1830s and 40s in which they thought that Christ was coming in 1844. When Christ did not, uh, they, these early Adventists tried to find another rationale for uh, what it might have happened then and they decided that Christ had actually entered from a holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, the temple in heaven, to the most holy place. Uh, she was the guiding light, often called the spirit of prophecy, normally called the spirit of prophecy by Seventh-day Adventism, until her death in 1915. She's built a quite a remarkably strong and great church, which still exists today and is expanding at an incredibly rapid pace. Uh, it's interesting, when I first started writing my manuscript in 1984, I said that Adventism had over four million members. In uh, 1985 or 1986, when I wrote my preface, I said Adventism boasted over 5 million members. Today, um, well, I, I believe it's probably over 6 million. In fact, very well may be over 7 million. They're, they're expanding at a rate 
If they keep it up, by the year 2007, every person on this earth will be a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's hope that extrapolation doesn't work out too well. <laughs> but, uh, Here's an idea of how they are expanding, they are, however. I would suspect a lot of that expansion is coming, uh, taking place overseas, perhaps. To a large extent. With Russia now opening its doors to... They are having religion. thousands of baptisms in Russia at this time. Uh, we just received a, a paper about this. All right. So that's where I would suspect overseas and other countries countries other right. than the United States where we're filming this is where, where people this rapid expansion. experienced a great loss and they don't know the facts, that's where the people are joining. Well, we found generally uh, anyone that's watched this series for any length of time knows that uh, one of the great, ad great advantages of a religious organization or a cult, let's say, uh, particularly a non-Christian cult, is ignorance by mm -hmm. the population. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a false religious cult can take advantage of ignorance and that's how they expand their base. And uh, I guess... Uh, after, what, 70 years of atheistic communism in Russia, let's say, is that example, uh, with hardly any gospel being preached. There's or, been a great hunger. Right, so uh, you can't ask for much better ignorance, can you? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so a false prophet comes in there and he can sound good as gold. Uh, that's what's when, happening. When no one knows the, the true word. But anyway, with that said, we won't even bother too much with Hiram Edson here. You gave a, you know, a great recap on him last time. I want to move into uh, these distinctive teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this will get us close to back where we were from last program. Uh, last time we were here, uh, we, we had a chart on some of the teachings that uh, they are known for. And uh, just looking at this chart briefly, we've got the, they keep the Sabbath day. Uh, they the have the Seventh-day Sabbath. Right, the Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, uh, point two, they have Old Testament dietary laws and, and they, they uh, espouse vegetarianism. Uh, we got into uh, in quite some detail last week, or last time we did the show, uh, the atonement and the sanctuary doctrine, investigative judgment. We'll get into that probably some more as we move through the, the programs. Uh, you had some fascinating information on uh, Ellen G. White's The Prophetess of Seventh-day Adventists, her ideas of redemption and how to accomplish it. Yeah, Mind-blowing stuff. Uh, and I think that's about where we were when we, uh, when we ran out of time last time. I have a copy of the, um, one of these statements that I gave last time about the lack of a mediator uh, yes. in the last days. Would you like me to put yeah, that why don't up? You, why don't you uh, put that up, and then we'll just continue on with the, sh you know, the series now from, from this point. To a Christian, and even to a Seventh-day Adventist, or to most Seventh-day Adventists, this statement is an absolute shocker. Now, this is from Great Controversy. Uh, I'm not sure which one is the four, page 425 or this, what is the other one there, 625? 614. 614. Well, let's take a look at this because it is something else. Uh, trying to locate my the source. Here. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Yeah. In other words, without Christ is no longer mediating for you. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent efforts, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. And then it gets on into the investigative judgment. Yeah, it talks like about that. the investigative judgment and so on. I might add that both my wife and I, as youth, were taught that in the last days we must stand before God without a mediator. This is still taught to Seventh-day Adventists. See, this nullifies the cruci uh, crucifixion of Christ. The uh, blood atonement of Christ right. on the cross mm -hmm. at Calvary. And that it really comes down to your, your own works, mm -hmm. your own goodness, uh, without a mediator, without Christ to do it for you, to uh, present your righteousness, you have to present your own righteousness uh, as the uh, final key in opening the door to heaven. Now, my understanding of Christianity, and this is something I have come to into over the last 10, 11 years, is that the essence of Christianity is that there is no salvation without the intercession of Christ, without the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. If you are standing there and can stand there on your own without a mediator, what does that do to your concept of Christianity? <clears throat> Where is the Christianity to it? Because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, wouldn't the Seventh-day Adventist, looking at this stuff, wouldn't he say like, uh, well, yeah, we still believe in Jesus as the intercessor, the mediator, because after all, he had to make it possible for us to get to this point where we're in this investigative judgment or something where now we need to make that last step to get into heaven. But he leaves. But he made it, he made it possible for us to get to that point. So, see, he's still our Savior. 
in that sense. But he leaves. Wouldn't they argue meeting. something like that? Oh, yes, they would. Of course, the, uh, the Bible says our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. That's right. We can never stand before the sight of God without uh, So Jesus. the minute you get away from the righteousness of Christ, you're damned. That's right. <laughs> so uh, you're, there's not even a hope. There is no, no hope. hope at all. Uh, Ellen White was very pessimistic about people. Uh, she made statements such as not in one in 20 is ready to be saved. Many statements along, along these was lines. Was that more like uh, sour grapes just because a lot of people didn't believe her? Well, sour grapes or not, it had a tremendous effect on people. You may be interested in knowing that her own 15-year-old son who died uh, at that age uh, welcomed death. Uh, I don't know, probably some childhood disease as things were back then. Mm -hmm. But he welcomed death. It is, it, uh, the Adventist scenario has been so gloomy that he was glad to die. And I think huh. that's a tragedy again. There are so many tragedies in Adventism. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking a lot about Ellen G. White here. I'm sure there's a lot of new viewers that haven't the slightest idea. But I know here on uh, point number five now in this chart that we've been going over, we have something called the divine mission of Ellen G. White. Now, uh, just for new viewers and some other people, uh, what is this divine mission of Ellen G. White? That is one that is very interesting for the simple reason that what the Adventists have given to the public and what they are telling their own people are two very different stories. Well, the Adventists will stand there in front of you and say, well, Ellen White is not an addition to the scriptures. She is uh, not to stand in place of the scriptures. They say they, they know how to punch all the right uh, buttons, so to speak. Mm -hmm. However, to their own people, they, the statements are very clear and explicit that Ellen White is the infallible interpreter. Mm -hmm. Now, that makes her an Adventist pope. Mm -hmm. And I have many statements like this. They seem to be coming out of the woodwork. It seems like in the last few months, or a few weeks even, I've been really working on these statements about uh, Ellen White being the infallible interpreter of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very difficult to get an Adventist to state one way or another whether it is or not. You just practically have to pin them down by the shoulders to the mat before they will admit one way or the other. They want it both ways. They want it both ways. Okay. But the statements I have are just incredible. I have a number with me. Let me pull some of these out. These are, these are concerns these are, the, the, the divine mission of Ellen G. White and right. what she has to say. And I know uh, we've got some charts coming up here later in the show that we'll get into quite some detail on that. Okay, here we are. You've got one that, uh, you've got so much documentation. I have so much documentation, that's right. Okay. Here's one. Uh, an official ch uh, church publication recently ridiculed the idea that Ellen White is not canonical, as good as the Bible, in addition to the Bible. What publication is that? Uh, this is the E.G. White Estate, Spirit of Prophecy Day Sermon, May 16, 1981. And D.A. Delafield, who is in the White Estate, or has been in the White Estate. Now, for new viewers, what is the White Estate? The White Estate is that organization that keeps and controls the writings of Ellen White. It is um, uh, very close to General, uh, uh, General Conference headquarters uh, near Washington, D.C. So now, this is D.A. Delafield. Original manuscripts That's and right. papers and things that right. she wrote. This is another leader in uh, the White Estate, D.A. Delafield, stating, get this one, Mrs. White is canonical as far as doctrinal interpretation authority is concerned. Mm. Now, even She's on the same par with the Bible. She's on the same par with the Bible. So if the Bible says it, it's true, and if Ellen G. White says it, it's true. Even the Adventist statement of uh, fundamental doctrines, this is a Seventh-day Adventist book, states that she is ongoing authority. Now, let me hold that up a little higher. Yes, yeah. I'll hold it up so you can see it there. And she's the ongoing authority. She is, the, she is authority, and she is ongoing authority. Okay. Uh, so, I have more. They're just all over the place. Now, this is Ron Graybill of the White Estate. Yeah. Mrs. White seems to argue at points that the visions constituted the final court of hermeneutical uh, appeal. In other words, if you had a question on doctrine, her visions were the final court of appeal. Like the Supreme Court. If That's you want right. it settled, she'll settle it for you. That's right. I have others. Listen, well, I had the one here. This is Robert Olson, Secretary of the White Estate. Mrs. White's, now he says Mrs. White's writings are non-canonical, but have the same authority 
as the messages of ancient prophets whose literary productions did not become part of the scriptures. That's a pretty high one. And if you think this is just something that might have happened in years past, because I have many other statements like this in my book, mm -hmm. including some uh, that, that I see as the court of last resort statements from the 1970s, this is a, an Adventist Review article that came out in 1991, just a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Listen to this. This, and this is written by Gary Patterson, assistant to the president, North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventists. The ministry of Ellen White, whose writings have become a de facto sacred text for the Seventh-day Adventist community. He goes on to state sacred that, text. and y you know, we as Protestants have always said sola scriptura, right. the Bible only for as far as doctrinal, right. this sort of thing. The Adventists, and it is mentioned in here, they teach prima scriptura. Prima. Uh, the, the scriptures are primary, but we have to include these other things. I have one more statement here. They are a sacred text of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the peel of truth in her works has made her so among our people. Huh. Now, these, this is only a year well, that old. That sounds like uh, she's got a pretty good divine mission for their organization. Oh, yes. Well, she has many statements. Um, there were people who said, well, her letters, because so many times there were real faults that came out in her letters, mistakes made. Right. They said, well, those are just her opinions. And she wrote statements that not one idea or one line has in my uh, writings has come from anything but God. Actually, a lot of it was copied yeah. from others. And we mentioned that last right. time, and we'll mention it again. Yes. Uh, some of the very statements she used to show that uh, she had, um, that it had come straight, straight from God, actually were copied from other divine writers of the period. Right. Now, now, this kind of ties in with this next point here about prophecy. Now, what is that uh, she was called in our opening of the show? We, we call her the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. Now, incidentally, yeah. Adventism has even backed off from that. Uh, it's interesting. As we used to say up in Nebraska, you chase her down one prairie dog hole and she pops up another. Right. But um, it seems like, uh, well, uh, I have a statement from an Adventist leader that she is not the spirit of prophecy. And that is going to stun many Adventists because she has always been called by Adventism the spirit of prophecy. But he says, no, she's not. He says, I believe she had the, um, the, the gift of prophecy, but she is not the spirit of prophecy. In other words, he's saying Adventism is wrong when it calls her that. i got a question here. Why, you know, just looking at this, an average Joe, let's say, I, why do people believe she's a prophet? Why? Well, this I mean, is why, interesting. Are you just brainwashed growing <laughs> up as a kid? I, you know, there's so many people that say they're prophets. Why do these people, who I'd assume are intelligent, good people, they just, you know, they're out there, they got a mind and everything. Why do they suddenly say Ellen G. White's a prophetess and not, let's say, Reverend Moon, who claims to be a messenger of God? Why? Why address that? Well, first of all, she claimed. Right, but so do all these other guys. There are certain tests that she, that she has supposedly passed. Oh, uh, so, so in the minds of Seventh-day Adventists. Well, she passed uh, the test of, see, what are some of the tests? Well, supposedly she led a good life. <laughs> well, that's dependent on what you find out in research. That's, I, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, but um, they also say that she taught, you know, speaks to the law and to the prophets. And therefore, you know. Okay, now y'all were both Seventh Day Adventists for what? How many years were you Seventh Day Adventists? I was from four, from birth until forty four, and so you were a Seventh Day Adventist for forty four years. Right. Carol, how many years were you a Seventh Day Adventist? Same amount of years. Same amount. Forty four. So I've got eighty eight years of Seventh Day Adventist <laughs> sitting no, here. With no, me. she's younger than I am, so it isn't oh, quite that many. Well, I mean, I'm just putting the, the years of the Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, but uh, now, putting yourself back in that mindset before you learned all these new things. What convinced you personally? Was it just because you were raised that way? Uh, was that how you just accepted her well, as a prophet? Well, first you were told what to believe. So and then, they, then the people convincing you would, would say that uh, she agreed with the Bible. Uh -huh. That and was so, one thing. so you just basically, because you, you're a kid, you're growing up, you accept what yeah. your parents say. Right. Yeah. I'm just fascinated, uh, you know, how people follow you know, they just get this idea that this person's a, a true prophet of God. And uh, 
since y'all have got experience, I figured that'd be kind of an interesting question. Uh, then you were told that she held a Bible up, a 40-pound Bible. She held it up. So you're given a lot of stories. A lot of stories. Which, as it turns out, in reality, are nothing more than that. Just stories that right. really weren't true. But you're accepting basically almost a lot of fables, sort of like the, the Greek did way back there with Zeus. You know, he thought mm -hmm. Zeus was up on a mountain. Uh, and it just comes down to a lot of almost like blind faith. Not based on any real facts, it's just, you know, you're taking this leap of faith and you just want to believe it because you want to believe it. What they do with uh, the uh, new convert is, Ellen White really isn't mentioned to the new convert. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is after you join the organization, then they will present you with certain proof texts, certain things she said that do correspond with the Bible. And once you accept those, then you are expected to believe that she is a prophetess of God. Mm -hmm. And you're going to accept her as such without question from then on. That's the way it's presented there. Uh, in other words, you don't know about the controversial parts of it. Right. right. So they, they, of course, they would be crazy to... Uh, it's like the Mormon missionary. He's not going to come up to your door and tell you, Oh, I, I believe Jesus is the spirit brother of the devil, and I'm going to be a god just like all Mormons are going to be gods. There's millions of gods. You know, he doesn't tell you that. He, right. he tells you things that almost anybody could accept at first and after they get you baptized and get you into their organization then they start feeding you these more controversial doctrines that mm -hmm. it'll be easier for you to swallow them but if you try to come on with them right up front they might get the door slammed in their face. And when you're in church you're just really bombarded with, with statements uh, that she's made in mm -hmm. sermons you hear about her so it's just it's just um... now that's that's an interesting question right there when you're sitting in the pew are the ser what's a sermon in a Seventh-day Adventist church like? Do they spend a lot of time on Jesus, or do you hear a lot about what Sister White says, or what's the breakdown? Uh, what's the percentage? Do you get a lot of Ellen G. White in a sermon in a Seventh-day Adventist church? It depends, again, on the minister. Now, in California, with the right-wing pastor, the uh, very perfectionistic pastor I mentioned previously, mm -hmm. basically the sermons were Ellen White sermons. Mm -hmm. with lots and lots of sanctification. Brethren, we, we need to do this. Brethren, we need to do that, and so on. Mm -hmm. With some miracles, of course, thrown in. Uh, now, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, the pastor we had was comparatively gospel-oriented as far as Adventist pastors go, and it was, we used to laugh about this. <coughs> the first three-fourths of the sermon would be a beautiful gospel sermon with good, straight gospel. Mm -hmm. But the last 15 minutes, the pastor would be very careful to throw in all the howevers. And these would be all the Ellen White quotes and so forth that basically negated everything the man had said up to that point. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the man knew the gospel, but at the same time, he knew enough to take care of his own job. Oh, uh, I see. So just to keep his own job, he has to compromise the gospel. Oh, yes, he did. <laughs> uh, amazing thing. So... Uh, Getting back to our chart then, that was just some fascinating questions I, it kind of spurred in my mind there as we were talking. But, uh, we've got these other doctrines. Uh, you, you got pro Did you have anything more you want to say in prophecy or should we go on to the soul sleep? Thing? I would like to mention some things about prophecy that I think are very relevant. And that is that Adventism is very strongly opposed to what it calls apostate Protestantism, which basically means all the other Protestant organizations. Oh, as but well they as do accept Roman Catholicism. Oh, no. And they're very strongly opposed to Roman Catholicism, although many of its doctrines are rather similar, or some of its doctrines are quite similar to uh, uh, Catholicism, as opposed to the pro uh, Protestantism it so strongly opposes. And they also like to make a big thing of spiritualism. Uh, their scenario for the last days are that Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism will join hands and will rule the world. At that time, these combined organizations, and by the way, with the uh, great uh, physical help of the United States, which is also going to be running the world. At this time, uh, they will unite in forcing a Sunday law upon the world, uh, forcing everybody to not merely to abstain from work on Sunday, but to worship on Sunday. It's sort of like a, uh, a universal blue law. Sort of, a uni <laughs> but much more so. It'll be a law forcing everybody to worship on that day, not okay. merely not buying cars you or You know, alcohol this sort of sounds like something Ellen G. White, White might have said. It's exactly what she said. And the, the, so at that it's time, almost like she's closes. the brain, and any kind of strange thing you hear coming out of the Seventh-day Adventists, it 
almost can be traced back to what Ellen G. White said. It does. Somewhere Incidentally, much of this, however, came from the theological suppositions of uh, some of the other leaders. She copied their theological suppositions as coming from her visions, and that has been documented. Mm -hmm. So, uh, she so just... it's not really all hers, although right. she makes it sound as if it is. Right. Uh, in those last days, then, there will be great persecution of what is left of Seventh-day Adventism. Mm -hmm. Toward the end, uh, God will announce through the heavens the day and hour of His coming. That's shades of William Miller's date setting right. again. They just can't seem to swallow that Matthew That's 24 right. passage. No, they no have their problems the with it. <laughs> and then Christ will come, the wicked will be destroyed, and so on. I, I could go okay. on. There's much more. Well, does this is tie in with this little mini point I had on here under Soul Sleep about the remnant church? Is that... What is this yes. remnant church? Is that tie-in? Like they're the, the they own? consider themselves the remnant church. And everybody right. else is in this apostate, apostate Babylon, yeah. Babylon type. Uh, right. The remnant church will be the only one that goes through. So this is more of this is almost like a cultic type doctrine of exclusivism. It's very paranoid. The idea is that uh, your neighbors and friends are going to be chasing you around the hills in the future, trying to kill you. And so, uh, is this something they still believe today? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. So when they're smiling at us and talking with us, and when we see some of their apologists on some TV shows right. trying to say, well, we're Christians just like you are, uh, but they have this belief that really that they think these Christians who they're fellowshipping with and, and talking with, they're going to hell or they're, they're, well, they're Babylon or they're... Very close. What's going to happen is either these people are going to, quote, straighten out, unquote, about the Sabbath, and become good Seventh-day Adventists, or of course they're going to be part of the permanently lost group that is chasing them over the hills, trying to uh, kill them. Now, now, is this, you mentioned before in the other show we did about a right wing and a left wing. Does the left wing believe this? Yes, they do. They believe this remnant idea? Oh, yes. So, uh, the left wing, they're basically, they're, well, they're Seventh-day Adventists, it's That's just right. that they're not as fanatical as, say, a radical as There as are two the separations right of the right wing versus the left wing. The first is on the gospel, and I don't know that we've had a chance to get into that. The left be wing, coming up later. The left wing does believe pretty much as we do about the justification by faith. They do think that sanctification does include such things as vegetarianism, uh, keeping the Sabbath, things of this sort. The right wing is, simply believes that upon accepting of Christ, we are saved to that point, and then we with Christ's help, work out our salvation from that time, trying to become perfect toward the end there. Mm -hmm. So we do have the gospel as one. And the other, of course, is the, um, uh, the role of Ellen White. Mm -hmm. um, the right wing actually uses her materials more than they do use the Bible. In fact, they, will, they have baldly stated that they believe in some respects that Ellen White's writings are superior to the Bible. They believe we have the original documentation, uh, we have her original autographs, and that it is more easy to understand because it was written by a modern-day woman instead of like the Bible. More 2000. contemporary. It so is that's much the more advantage that you've got right. all these advantages to Ellen G. White as opposed to this Bible, which was written a long time ago. The left wing tends to be more ambivalent about Ellen White. I would say that maybe there's even embarrassment about her. They recognize that there's a lot of shortcomings and many problems with Ellen White. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, at times it almost seems like they'd like her to go away. Now, now you're mentioning all this stuff about uh, the remnant church and, and all this terrible stuff. I, I want to just use this moment here. I want to show this to our people at home. We got a, I've got a little track here that's been, ma or a little mail-out thing, actually. It says, Armageddon now. Time is running out for planet Earth. You owe it to yourself to attend this astounding Revelation Seminar. And uh, basically, this thing here, it, it has a picture of a, a, you know, a, a time piece, a, a sands running out in an hourglass. And you open it up, and there's all these pictures of different apocalyptic type things that are going to happen in the book of Revelation and stuff. And, Does the name Seventh-day Adventist appear on it anywhere? Uh, I really haven't noticed. I'll uh, guarantee se it does. It says Seminars Unlimited. It right. says coming out of Keene, Texas. It does? And, well, that's and, uh, For many years, they didn't. It says, oh, it says here, Georgetown Adventist Church Revelation Seminar. Well, that's an improvement. I'm and happy to so see they, that they're a little more open about it. So they are changing some things. But uh, I, I just thought we'd take a moment here with this, this in hand and that people are able to see one of these mail-outs and that these are going on all the time, these so-called Revelation Seminars. Mm -hmm. Could you just kind of briefly tell for a minute, the uh, viewers at home, 
if they were ever fascinated by something they might see, because these are pretty slick advertising pieces. They got four color ads here. I've seen full page ads in newspapers and, oh, yes. and other things. They, they put some real money into this thing. Yes, they do. What can a, an average guy out there, he's fascinated by this, oh, prophecy, end time, revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, what is he really going to get from a, a revelation seminar? This is interesting. Uh, what usually happens is that uh, they will start off with studies of some of the old prophecies, Daniel 2 with, you know, the, uh, the four kingdoms, including the Roman Empire, followed by the divided Europe, etc. So there will be a number of prophecies they'll go through. Then they start getting into the law. They love the law. They'll, they'll talk about the, the, uh, how the, they believe the Ten Commandments are still binding upon humanity. Mm -hmm. Then they get into the Sabbath, the need to keep the Sabbath. Then they'll get into the dietary rules we talked about up here. everything on our chart. Right. Uh, well, I guess they wouldn't get into Ellen G. White too much since no, they, usually, it's the first contact with them. In fact, I have talked to Seventh-day Adventists who never had her presented to them before becoming Seventh-day Adventists, converted mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists. It's just a strategy of not That's right. bringing her on until after they get you in. On the other hand, I have seen uh, talks given on uh, Ellen White and how they believe she is a spirit of prophecy and so on. So it, it seems to go either way. Okay. So, uh, so basically, are they going to get a good, sound, uh, a biblical exposition of the Book of Revelation on end time prophecy? Oh uh, well, they'll certainly get a good, sound exposition on the Seventh Day Adventist view of the Book of Revelation. <laughs> <Daniel>. <laughs> okay. Right. Mm -hmm. They are very apocalyptic in their viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Right. And from what I understand, they, they uh, really, in their interpretation of Revelation, they. Uh, they have something called historicism, basically applying like the French Revolution to a passage of Revelation. Something That's a good something question. Like you know, I'd like to ask that right now of, our, of, of a Seventh-day Adventist. The Adventist literature is full of discussion on the French Revolution. That's fine. But where is the discussion on the great communist revolution that makes the French Revolution look like an anthill? There is <laughs> That's none. That's true. That's true. And, that uh, is all a 19th century apocalyptic uh, schema. Right, right. And I've noticed uh, from my studies in the Jehovah's Witnesses that uh, Charles Taz Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, he uh, came up with a, his own exposition of the book of Revelation. And a lot of what he has in his book uh, kind of ties in with the same kind of uh, Adventist view of Revelation where he's, he's saying, well, this verse is the French Revolution. And this verse means some historical event over here. And this Russell verse. came out of the early Adventist movement. Well, so the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Adventists have common ties at their beginnings. Yes. Something that I don't believe the Seventh-day Adventists are very enthusiastic in, about. In fact, uh, speaking of that, there is almost a, a, a tie between a lot of these uh, American pseudo-Christian groups or cults, you might want to say, in that you've got the... Uh, restoration movement back around the early 1800s with Alexander and Thomas Campbell. They started something called a Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ, Christian Church, stuff like that. Out of that group came uh, Sidney Rigdon who was in the Church of Christ with Alexander Campbell. He got with Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. They put together the Book of Mormons and so forth. Out of that uh, they, a lot of these guys start getting mixed up with the Millerite movement. And, and from there, the Adventists, from there, Charles Taz Russell, the Christadelphians with Dr. Moore. Uh, and it gets to be a pretty fascinating thing as you, you look at all these groups and how the Seventh-day Adventists are tied right in with all these early 18th century, or 1800s, uh, early 19th century, uh, American uh, religious movements going on. They were part of what's called the Burnt Over District, which is uh, from, shall we say, Pennsylvania on through New York on up into New England, where again and again and again they had uh, uh, religious revivals. Right. And it just left the country, as they called it, burnt over, just totally burned out in religion by the time <laughs> they were done with all these. I see, because it, it was really going hot and heavy, I'll tell right. you that much. Well, we're about ready to go on to our next chart practically here. We've gone through, you know, we had the soul sleep. Uh, remnant Church. Uh, there are some uh, things about where Ellen G. White had said, said something about the sinful nature of Christ, and we'll get into that maybe in, later on in the show, uh, somewhere in there. And there was one other question I, I put it on a chart just to remind myself because I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, Seventh Day Adventists, like most churches, they they have something like the Lord's Supper, the communion. Service. Oh yes. Is there anything? Uh, of course. 
I think I know what it is, but uh, is there anything that's distinctive about a Seventh-day Adventist communion service that maybe a lot of other churches wouldn't, wouldn't practice? Well, I'm not really sure what you're aiming at. Uh, I can tell you two things that might seem a little unique. One is that the wine is, uh, grapefruit, is grape juice. Okay. And okay, that goes back to that dietary stuff. Right. The other, and I'm not sure, is that it, uh, there is a foot washing involved. Is that what you're... That's what I was pointing yeah. at. I was looking for the foot washing because uh, uh, I'm kind of wondering where in the Bible does it say to wash your feet to take the Lord's Supper? You know, it's kind of a, an interesting distinctive uh, on, on a common sacrament. It was, mm -hmm. I, th I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, viewpoint that uh, they can yeah. take the Lord's Supper. When you look at the passages... You know the Lord's the the, the Lord's Supper. I mean, uh, the foot washing is mentioned in John 13, but that's uh, completely different from where you find the passages about the Lord's Supper. And it, it's kind of interesting how unrelated passages of text are <laughs> are put together in, in, in a common sacrament. So uh, it, it makes you think. Well, if this can happen on this, can it happen on other other doctrines and teachings? You know. Well, as you can imagine, the foot washing does lead to some very interesting uh, situations, and perhaps we'd better not get into that. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, very very fascinating. But uh, from what I've understood from another Seventh Day Adventist I talked to, a former one, he, he said uh, it actually kind of kills a lot of the participation in the communion service and that a lot of people don't like to participate in foot washing. So a lot of people correct. will stay home that day. Yeah, so they just don't even bother to come to church mm -hmm. so that it can avoid foot washing. So actually mm -hmm. this doctrine added on actually takes away from what's supposed to be uh, a demeaning. joyful time mm -hmm. with the Lord. It, I always felt it was demeaning, but uh, maybe that was... Yeah, it was just, I just thought it was kind of interesting. It's something you don't see too often. You know. There's, mm -hmm. I think the primitive Baptists get into foot washing and stuff, but that just was one of those I've heard the story points. of the mill workers that all wore blue socks in the time they had a surprise foot washing, and they took their socks off, and here were this long line of blue feet. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, I guess with that, what we want to do is is move on to some interesting questions. Or we're, of course, we're tying this whole series into a, a question we ask in, a, in part one, is there were certain questions you can ask to determine whether a religious organization is a cult or not, a, a cult grouped around someone's interpretation of the Bible. <laughs> And once they do that, then they go beyond what the Bible clearly teaches on cardinal Christian doctrines. And we're trying to ascertain if Seventh-day Adventists uh, fall into that category. And uh, with that said, I've got a chart here asking the question, Ellen G. White, God's prophet? And uh, basically I have some quotes here from Ellen G. White uh, with references and page numbers and so forth. And uh, Wallace, I'd like you to... Kind of read, I'm sure you've seen this before. It's probably even in your book oh, somewhere. Sure. But uh, I'd like you to go through a couple of these, and I think we've got some more on the ensuing charts. But uh, let's let's give the viewers an idea of how important Ellen G. White is as, as far as being seen as, a, as God's prophet. Well, uh, you can see this first statement, God was speaking through clay in these letters which I write in the testimonies I bear. I am presenting that to, to you, that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Even parts of that were copied. You're kidding. That's right. Really? Yes. <laughs> you mean she couldn't even say this without That's stealing right. something from That's somebody right. else? They've had their big problems about her copying. Um, they used to say, well, you know, here we have this amazing thing, this girl who only went through third grade. Remember how I mentioned that she was injured when she was right. a, a small child? Then later on, they said, well, you know, she was, and they used this as evidence. I mean, here are these marvelous things being written, and yet, you know, we have this girl with a third grade education. Then Sounds later, like the Mormons. They always tell me Joseph Smith only had a fourth grade education. Oh, okay. It had to be from God that he wrote this Book of Mormon and all Very this good. kind of stuff. Later on, they began saying, well, maybe she had a little better education than we uh, thought she had previously. Then later on, they said, well... Uh, Maybe she uh, saw some things and unconsciously copied them, and not even knowing that. She had a photographic had mind, them. they said. The, finally, they came to, well, she had an unconscious photographic mind. She would read things, photograph them in her mind, and later on, unconsciously write them out. Now, there's a very interesting statement written by her own husband about the copying, and there were tremendous amounts of copying. Uh, the Adventist leadership has admitted um, 
Well, I have one statement by the Adventist leadership in which they admit that over 50% of the great controversy was copied. That's uh, a book. That's the major written. her book. Her major book, the Great Controversy, which tells about the history of Adventism leading on up through these great apocalyptic events I told you about. The investigative right, judgment. Right, the investigative all. judgment, all these things. Uh, her husband, James, wrote a very good uh, statement about this. Let me, let me pull it out here. Okay. And James uh, White, that's her husband. That's right. And he had uh, some things to say about the... Uh, okay, here we are. This is uh, James White writing. Does unbelief suggest that what she writes in her personal testimonies has been learned from others? We inquire, what time has she had to learn all these facts? And who for a moment can regard her as a Christian woman if she gives her ear to gossip, then writes it out as a vision from God? And where is the person of superior natural and acquired abilities who could listen to the description of one, two, or three thousand cases all differing and then write them out without getting confused, laying the whole work liable to a thousand contradictions. Listen to this. If Mrs. White has gathered the facts from a human mind in a single case, she has in thousands of cases. And God has not shown her these things which she has written in these personal testimonies. I'm going to give you one more statement. In her published works there are many things set forth which cannot be found in other books. And yet they are so clear and beautiful that the unprejudiced mind grasps them as truth. If commentators and theological workers generally had seen these gems of thought which strike the mind so forcibly, and had they been brought out in print, all the ministers in the land could have read them. These men gather thoughts from books, and as Mrs. White has written and spoken a hundred things as truthful as they are beautiful and harmonious, which cannot be found in the writings of others. They are new to the most intelligent readers and hearers. And if they're not to be found in print and are not brought out in sermons from the pulpit, where did Mrs. White find them? From what source has she received the new and rich thoughts which are to be found in her writings and oral addresses? She could not have learned them from books, from the fact they do not contain such thoughts. Certainly she did not learn them from those ministers who had not thought of them. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is horrifying to the Adventist believer, every condition that James White laid down here that would make her a false prophet, every one of them Ellen White has met. Everyone. Got the documented facts? That's right. On, it's on all every documented. Case. That's right. So he, her own husband would condemn her through his words there. Inadvertently, but he a, did. Right. As a false prophet. That's right. Well, that's fascinating. Well, let's go on here with uh, this chart. I'll go ahead and read this one real quick, move on to the next. Um, this is Ellen G. White still talking here. She says, When I send you a testimony of warning and reproof, many of you declare it to be merely the opinion of Sister White. You have thereby insulted the Spirit of God. So anytime anyone would say, oh, it's just your opinion. She, she says, no. you know, it's like right. you're, you're slapping God in the face here. You know, you better, you better not take it as my opinion. It's coming from God. Mrs. White had an interesting thing happen in the early 1900s I'd like to share with you okay. because it's very interesting. There were Adventist leaders who were saying, you know, we've got real, really serious problems with what you're saying and your claims. We don't know for sure that you are really truly a prophet of God. So she said... And she wrote out a testimony, supposedly straight from an angel, saying, God has directed me that if any of you have questions, write them out, and I will answer them. And she sent this out to these people. They thought that's very fair. So they wrote out their questions. They wrote out, a, as I remember, about a dozen questions about various things that had come up. She took these questions... A few weeks later, she sent out another testimony. The angel of the Lord came to me in a vision in the night and said, Don't answer these questions. God changed his mind. Whoa, you have the document? document? Yes, I do. I don't, uh, now, that'd be a hard for some people to believe. I don't think I have it, it right, right here, but I have it, and I can produce it to you in a little bit. Oh, man, that's, that's incredible. I mean, it, that's right in the... I have it. Oh, you've got it? Yes, I just thought of it. Oh, okay. Hold on. What is this? Uh, what, that's an, this is a very interesting little called? article. Okay. Okay, the first was a testimony. Um, would you like me to read it to you? I have the whole thing, or should I just give you... It's, it's again, the um, 
People involved in the medical work, and she talks about Dr. Kellogg, that's J.H. Kellogg, the brother of W.K. who started Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Yes. Uh, Elders Jones, Tanny, Taylor, etc. I was directed by the Lord to request them and any others who have perplexities, etc., to specify what their objections and criticisms are. The Lord will help me to answer these objections, make plain that which seems to be intricate. Let those who are troubled now place upon paper a statement of the difficulties, etc. Let it all be written and submitted. Okay. Now, the uh, physicians from Battle Creek sent written replies to the above letter in compliance with the divine instructions stating their numerous and well-founded perplexities concerning her testimonies. But Mrs. White refused to answer their questions on the basis of this later revelation. Sabbath night a week ago, after I had been prayerfully studying over these things, I had a vision in which I was speaking before a large company where many questions were asked concerning my work and writings. I was directed by a messenger from heaven not to take up the burden of picking up and answering all the sayings and doubts that are being put into many minds. God changed his mind. God changed his mind. Could you hold that up for one more moment here to the camera? I'd like to, people to see a picture of Ellen White in her old age. <laughs> I'll, just put it, I'll just put it on the thing here. That's, uh, that's probably when she was in her 80s already, something like that. I would, I would assume so, yes. Yeah, she lived to be, I think I read some Seventh-day Adventist publication where she was over 70, 70 years in public ministry. I think that's correct. She was 87 yeah, when like she that. passed away. There she is. and uh, uh, Never, uh, never recanted. Never. Uh, anything she said or wrote. It's interesting. Her son, Willie White, years later, said, Mother was directed by God to find various things and uh, that she thought were good and to insert them in her writings, bring them out, various truths. Mm -hmm. Yet when she told me about these, these, she told me not to tell others that she had been doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other words, deceit was being... Uh, uh, practiced uh, from the beginning. She knew it all along. She knew what she was doing, mm -hmm. and she continued it right up to the last. Incredible. Incidentally, some of the last books came out after uh, months and even a year after she had passed away, and basically, um, and the White Estate has not even bothered to argue with this. Walter Ray has demonstrated that they were compilations of put together by others under her like secretaries, supervision. Of other staff secretaries, people, stuff like that. Right. Huh. But but pushed off as her stuff. But pushed off as straight as visions straight, straight from heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah, amazing. Well, go on back to the chart then and kind of keep rolling along here. What we have. I just got a few more quotes here just to back up what uh, what's being said here. Here's uh, here's uh, another statement. Those who are reproved by the Spirit of God should not rise up against the humble instrument. It is God and not an erring mortal who has spoken to save them from ruin. Testimony for the Church, Volume 3, page 257. That's Ellen G. White uh, saying, don't rise up against me, a humble servant <laughs> or instrument. Uh, not, you know, don't look at me. You know, this, is coming, this is God that's talking to you here. And basically down here, and I think we've seen this before, this is coming from the Advent Review and Herald from October 4, 1928. Now, the Advent Review and Herald, is that an official... Yes, uh, it magazine is. of the Seventh Day Adventist yes, Church. Yes, it is. Uh, many of the documents I've brought out came straight from what is today called the Adventist Review. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this goes back to October 4, 1928. You say, Seventh Day Adventists hold that Ellen G. White performed the work of a true prophet during the 70 years of her public ministry. That's what I was just talking about. As Samuel was a prophet, as Jeremiah was a prophet, as John the Baptist, so we believe that Mrs. White was a prophet to the Church of Christ today. Here's another statement. This is a fairly recent one from the Adventist Review. Today, the Bible only is the cry of some who seek to discredit Mrs. White and undermine the authority of her writing. On the surface, this slogan sounds logical and appealing, but when analyzed carefully, it is seen to be invalid. And it goes on that we, uh, well, comparing her to the writings of Luther and so forth. The problem is, of course, that Ellen White was considered to be an infallible interpreter of the Bible. And in 1971, the Adventist Review re describes her as the only infallible commentator on the Bible and the final court of appeal among God's people. Mm -hmm. Now, this takes us back to the last thing I have on this chart about testing the prophet. She's right. obviously, they're, they're elevating her to the status of a biblical prophet uh, with full authority, canonical, all the rest of it. And uh, we mentioned this on the last show in passing, and now we'll mention again here the Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 passage right out of the Bible where the, the Word of God tells you how, you how do you test somebody that claims to be a prophet of God. And uh, just reading from the text here, 
Out of Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 20, it says, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Okay, there's the te- how, how are we going to know if this person is a true prophet? Verse 22, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord had not spoken, but the prophet had spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him, or as you mentioned before, uh, don't, even, don't really respect him at all. Adventism has a major problem with that, and the reason is that you see, if Adventism describes Ellen White as the infallible interpreter of the Bible, that means basically that the Bible is being interpreted by Ellen White. I, I, I'm sorry, that the Bible is being tested by Ellen White. Because no matter what you read from the Bible, you take her interpretation and that's the only interpretation that there is. It is circular reasoning. How can you test Ellen White by the right Bible when everything she says is correct? That's true. That's true. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how she interpreted this passage that we just read. <laughs> I wonder what she would say. Well, it's not that. brought by the, out by the Seventh-day Adventist <laughs> denomination, I assure you. Right, right. So, uh, so far in these two hours that we've done on this particular program, this series we're doing on Seventh-day Adventism, uh, we haven't even started, really. It's we're just coming up in the next, Right. In the next show, we'll be getting into some real meat on uh, looking at Ellen G. White's uh, teachings, prophecies, other things. We're going to really get into this thing and, and bring this Matthew, I mean Deuteronomy 18 passage to play. But I think uh, Wallace has already said plenty of things already to <laughs> kind of shake the foundations, I think, of, uh, uh, of this uh, prophetess, Ellen G. White. Uh, now, if y'all would like more information on this, we're, we're running out of time in this particular program, uh, but uh, please call or write our ministry. The numbers will come up on your screen at the end of the program. Uh, uh, we've had phone numbers popping up from time to time on the screen. Uh, you can write Wallace here personally. I'm sure you, an- you answer uh, per- personal correspondence as oh, well. Oh, yes, I do. People uh, might have specific questions they may want to call to your attention and see what you have to say about a, a certain subject. In fact, uh, why, don't take this mo- to say. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you take this moment to give your address again for those that might be interested in the, uh, this topic. It's Stepping Stones Ministry at Box L1124, Langhorne, Pennsylvania, L-A-N-G-H-O-R-N-E, 19047. I'd like to say something to the Seventh-day Adventist believer who might be following. And that is my wife and I, we love you as a believer. If we didn't love Seventh-day Adventists, we would have major problems with members of my family because they are still devout Seventh-day Adventists. But we do what we're saying is aimed at the organization and against leaders who know what they are describing and that so many of these things have been hidden from the people. Uh, the gospel of Jesus is a simple and beautiful thing. It doesn't need to be hidden and obfuscated with many complicated and complex uh, interpretations. It seems like Adventist leaders are constantly explaining Bible verses that they really don't mean what they claim they do. Mm-hmm. Very well said. Uh, I want to thank our viewers for watching once again. Uh, this is part two of uh, our series. We'll be continuing again next time, next week, this time on this channel. So please join us. Uh, I'm Larry Wessel, your host. And if you'd like some literature, other information we have available, particularly from uh, the Research and Education Foundation, of which I'm a, a staff member, uh, feel free to call or write. We'll be glad, more than happy to send you any kind of information on this particular topic that uh, you, you may require. Uh, we're trying to be uh, open and upfront. We're not trying to espouse any hate towards anybody. Uh, the key here is truth, biblical truth. Uh, if we really hated Seventh Day Adventism, I, I doubt that, or Adventists, I doubt we'd even bother doing these shows. Cause right. Let them just Wouldn't believe care. what they want to believe, and if they end up in hell, that's their own problem, you know. But, but we love you, and uh, we want to make that point clear. Well, God bless you. Thank you uh, for joining us, and tune in again next time. God, God bless. Bye bye.
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. is your host, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Our topic is Seventh-day Adventism. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time today, you've already missed two shows in this series, but uh, I think you'll still find it rather fascinating, and uh, hopefully so fascinating you'll want to investigate on how to see the first two shows we've already done in this series. But anyway, the topic is one that you don't hear too much about, and I hope you grab a friend, have them come to the TV or call a friend up or maybe even get the VCR started and record this show so if you want to share it with others uh, you more, we're more than happy for you to do so but uh, the topic is Seventh-day Adventism we've got a very special guest today to help us in this program he was a Seventh-day Adventist for 44 years he's written a book I think one of the best books out right now on this, the subject are Seventh-day Adventists false prophets uh, my very special guest is Wallace Slattery and uh, we'll take a look at him now on the television monitor and his uh, wonderful wife, Carol. Wallace, it's great to have you here. Happy to be here. Yes, and Carol. Happy to be here. And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, you were in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for many years, uh, sure. as well as your wife. We were workers for 10 years. And you were really involved with the... the nominational employees. Right. Now, what we have here, uh, in previous shows, we've already gone into quite a bit of background and stuff. We want to utilize our time to get us some new material, so we apologize to our viewers out there who uh, haven't had a chance to see that uh, material before, but if you can get your hands on copies of it from the past, then please do so. Uh, today, we're going to get into a whole new range of material centering on the Seventh-day Adventist prophet, or prophetess, in this case, Ellen G. White who claimed to be the spirit of prophecy, or was called that by her followers. And uh, as we've gone into some detail in previous shows, uh, her followers at the SDA Church and others have elevated her uh, writings and teachings to the, uh, to the level of Scripture itself. Uh, where she speaks, God speaks, something along those lines. Well, anyway, on my chart board here, in case you were wondering about this, uh, uh, this prophet of God, uh, I have a, a picture of Ellen G. White here on this magazine cover. Uh, if our TV camera can zoom in on her, uh, that's the prophetess of the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, Ellen G. White, she died in 1915, I believe, at the age of that's 87. Correct. And uh, she's left behind, I think, a battery of somewhere around 66 books that she's written, or uh, supposedly is written, uh, as uh, we'll get into more detail as we go along on, on that. But uh, what we'd like to do today is get into the question, and it's on the chart board again. I'll take Ellen off the, the chart board here, and put her aside, and uh, go back to my chart now. And we have a, uh, a question up here about, was Sister White, as she's commonly called by Seventh-day Adventists, uh, a true prophet? in the biblical sense. And of course there's three tests here. The first test, the true prophet never writes factual mistakes of any substance. Two, the true prophet never disagrees with the Bible. 
And three, the true prophet of God consistent, consistently maintains the highest ethical standards, especially with regards to his messages from God. Now the question is, did she, that's Ellen G. White, ever make substantive mistakes in her teachings? Okay, now at this point, Wallace, uh, if you'd like to preface anything else before we get into this, but I'd like you to take over at this point, and I'll, I'll jump in, Carol will jump in when we can, and, and uh, start, let's start answering some of these questions. Uh, you know, uh, did she make mistakes? Uh, we're going to go through a wide variety of some of the things that Sister White wrote. I'd like to point out that some of these may seem minor. Some of them are a, of just great major importance. But you will see a wide variety of mistakes in the writings of Ellen White this afternoon. The first one I'm going to bring up is the cause of volcanoes and earthquakes. Ellen White wrote in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, the action of the waters upon the lime, now this is talking about subterranean, adds fury to the intense heat and causes earthquakes, volcanoes, and fiery issues as the can't read that. A uh, bifocal. Fire. Fire and water come in contact with ledges of rock and ore. There are heavy explosions underground which sound like muffled thunder. The air is hot and suffocating. Volcanic eruptions follow. Now, this is basically, I'm sure, a Victorian explanation or maybe very early explanation of, about volcanoes. The idea was that there were rivers of uh, water and oil coming in contact with the uh, within the lime causing fire and that the explosions and so forth coming up from this or resulting from this would cause um, volcanoes and earthquakes well today of course we know that volcanoes and earthquakes both are both are caused by the tectonic plates uh, moving having contact with each other gaps occurring this sort of thing it has nothing whatever to do with uh, underground ledges of uh, coal and uh, pools of oil catching on fire. She was wrong in the simplest sense. Now that sounds like she's wrong about science. She was wrong scientifically. The Adventists used to like to point to the, uh, the uh, planet that had rings and eight moons and say, See, she knew about uh, Jupiter or uh, Saturn even before uh, the scientists knew about it. Well, today we know that Saturn has quite a number of moons. I, the last I heard was like 15 or 16. No eight moons as she described. And now, whether that was Saturn or not, the point is that they cannot point to it and say she was correct in her description. There are many things as far as, uh, and which we'll get into as far as science goes where she was wrong in what oh, she Oh, well, by the way, on that Saturn thing, uh, you know, she had stated that the, the planet Saturn is inhabited. Oh, yes, she stated that if that would be it, that the planet... It's, planet it's found Saturn in the Adventist inhabited. writers uh, J.N. Loughborough in his book, the, the Great Second Advent Movement, page 260. He's quoting Ellen G. White on Saturn. Now she says Saturn is inhabited. I believe she saw Enoch on it. And uh, this kind of reminds me of Joseph Smith talking at, or uh, no, it's Brigham Young. He said that uh, people lived on the sun. And of course, Joseph Smith said people lived on the, the moon. moon. That's correct. And they were about six feet tall and dressed like Quakers. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it seems like uh, she's almost been hanging around the same kind of pe people, you know. <laughs> but anyway, go, go ahead here, Wallace. That's fascinating. 1856, we had a very interesting statement that uh, came from Ellen White here. She wrote, she thought that there were people Alive then, at a conference they had, who would see the seven plagues? She wrote here, I was shown the company present at the conference. Said the angel, some food for worms, some subjects of the seven last plagues, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. Well, needless to say, that caused a lot of fast calculations among the Adventists over the years. Who's alive? How old are they? And so forth. And of course, you and I both know that today nobody from that conference back there in 1856 is alive today. Uh, now it's interesting, F.D. Nichols in his uh, defense of Ellen White called Ellen White and her critics said, ah, but this is a conditional prophecy. And he pointed to the prophecy of Jonah where he came to Nineveh and said, what is it, three days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 
and of course the people repented and it didn't happen. But I'd like to point out that when God says, God has tremendous mercy. If he says, you're going to be destroyed and people repent, God has shown in case after case in the Bible where he said, well, we'll give them another chance. However, when God promises good things, like the coming of the end, Jesus returning to save us, if it is conditional, if there are conditions involved, he's very specific. An example would be the Israelites, where God says, if you will do these good things, then I will be your God, and you're going to live this idyllic state here on earth, a, a heavenly state on earth. But he's very specific that these are conditional. When God says these, that this is going to happen and it is something good, God is not conditional, unless he states it specifically. God said Jesus is coming to save the world. Was that conditional? No. When God said to the Israelites in uh, captivity in Babylon, 70 years from now, you'll be sent back to Israel. Was that conditional? No, it was unconditional. Think about it. If every time a prophet gives a conditional statement, I'm sorry, if every time the prophet gives a statement, if you say it is automatically conditional, then what's the point of having the prophecy? <laughs> you know. Now, so, assuming that point then, then you'd have to, yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious then, she just... It's an unconditional a, statement. It's just a uh, outright mistake. Right. Uh, given through a vision, or, you know, by a Spirit of God, which would prove in that case that she's a false prophet. That's right. Uh, beyond a, a shadow of a doubt. Now, she even said in a volume four of her testimonies to the church that she said the testimonies are of the Spirit of God or of the devil. When she gave these revelations and teachings, she gave uh, a, almost a conditional, <laughs> a condition that, that either what she says is from God or it's from the devil. There's no in between. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if you take her own words, then, you'd have to say that she got this from the devil. It's something for people to think about, isn't it? I mean, you know, based on her well, own what words. What she said, yeah. So, well, go on, Well, This is fascinating. Okay, uh, <laughs> this one, uh, let's see. In spiritual gifts, and Sister White wrote this twice. This, this is an absolutely incredible statement, uh, especially if you belong to a member of a racial minority. Uh, this one may really stun you. In spiritual gifts, Sister White wrote, but if there was one sin above others which called from above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere God purposed to destroy that powerful long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him now there's another statement do you have it here or uh it, it's to the same effect anyway. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, here we are. There it is. Okay. Every, up here at the top. Every species of animal which God created were preserved in the ark. The confused species which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost varieties of, almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of men. Now, the Adventists today say, oh, well, that's referring to confused interbreeding of people without thought of what they might produce and so forth. However, I can assure you that back then when they said that, in fact, it was written by her supporters, uh, they were talking about certain races of Indians or even certain races of black people. All that's documented in your book. Yes, it is. Now, this statement here comes from Ellen G. White from her Spiritual Gifts book. Is that right? Right. Uh, I guess One more thing I'd like to mention. Amalgamation, if you look it in the, up in the dictionary, means combination. Read into it a combination and see what you have. The confused species which God did not create, which were the result of combination, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been combination of man and beast. That means interbreeding. It wasn't until about 1947 when the Adventists were becoming very con uh, embarrassed by this statement. They said, oh, it simply means inter confused interbreeding and so on. Uh, incidentally, the Bible's never had a problem with that. You know, Genesis states that every, uh, every species will breed after its own kind. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't have a problem with it. Ellen did. Uh, that's uh, certainly shocking there on, 
on that. Are, are you saying that most Seventh-day Adventists know all about this? I would say very few do, and those who do simply take the word of the leaders that they're referring to just an inter a confused interbreeding of people without thought of what they're doing. It's, they're very vague on what it actually means. It's one of those deals where you've got a point-blank statement, but they're going to go to their leaders right. who are going to kind what of really whitewash means. it. Oh, yes. Try to cover Happens it often. Okay, now we've got another one here, uh, letter D. What does it say here? It says, Ellen White taught that masturbation mm -hmm. causes cancer, small heads and busts, misshapen heads, <laughs> a peculiar gait, small eyes that appear swollen at times. What is that, a sieve? Like, a sieve like memory. <laughs> a sieve like memory, spinal trouble, and weakened mental powers, among other disastrous results. And that's coming from their comprehensive index to the right. She has of, many statements. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Ellen G. White, and it's published by the Seventh Day. Is that from the Seventh Day Adventist? Yes, it is. Pacific Press Publishing. Right. And it, you've got the, the, the documentations there. She speaks so strongly about this, there have been people who speculated as to what her problem was about these. Now, as Christians, we don't believe that uh, this is something that is satisfactory or spiritually enlightening. Right. We all understand that. Let's tie in with it, another statement. I have a reason for it, and this is about wigs. Wigs overheat the brain and needlessly excite the system. And it's from now, words to Christian mothers. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's interesting. Um, even though Christians do not believe that this is uh, this uh, masturbation, sex, self, sexual stimulation is something that uh, Christians believe in, we ha there is no evidence whatever that it causes any of these diseases. And finally, the leadership of the White Estate itself has admitted that these statements are wrong. I have it right here. The, the top dogs. These are the people at the top. Now, this is um, Graybill and Robert Olson, two of the top men in the White Estate. And Christianity Today queried them about these statements, and this is what they said in return. Graybill answers this objection to White's authority by holding that her inspiration extends only to areas that directly relate to faith and practice. Olson said that all those scientific details might be incorrect. The principles behind White's statement were sound on the undesirability of masturbation, for example. That's all a quote. Again, going back to Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 and 22, if the prophet says it's so and it's not so, regard him not. That's right now. This reminds me also of, uh, just to <laughs> stay on this subject just for a little bit longer, on this wigs thing, which I, I don't know, I, I got a lot of laughs out of it myself when I was doing some research on it, but I got a, another quote here from uh, Ellen G. White's uh, Volume 6, Number 4, 1871 edition, there were testimonies to the church. Uh, she stated, the artificial hair and pads covering the base of the brain heat and excite the spinal nerve centering in the brain. The head should ever be kept cool. The heat caused by these artificials induces the blood to the brain. The action of the blood upon the lower or animal organs of the brain causes a natural activity, uh, tends to uh, recklessness in morals, and the mind and heart is in danger of being corrupted. She goes on to say, many have lost their reason and have become hopelessly insane by following this deforming fashion. Uh, yet the slaves to fashion will continue to thus dress their head and suffer horrible disease and premature death rather than be out of fashion. So I'm wondering if a lot of people were in hospitals and mental institutions because they wore wigs. I don't know about that. I think there were people who ended up in mental hospitals because of her teachings. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds more plausible. <laughs> well, I just couldn't resist that quote. You Here's know, another just... great statement. And I, by the way, I have found this written several times. It is not merely just written once. Okay. Back in about 1884, 1885, she called for celibacy among Adventists because uh, the Christ's return was so imminent. And here's a typical statement. It was not in accordance with our faith of God's will that our missionaries should fill their hands with cares and burdens that were not essential to the work. I was shown that brother and sister V's, I have the name somewhere, had departed from God's counsel in bringing into the world children. The time is and has been for years that the bringing of children into the world is more an occasion of grief than joy, 
Satan controls these children, and the Lord has but little to do with them. The time has come when, in one sense, they that have wives be though they had none, be as though they had none. Well, you can imagine the mischief and uproar that this caused in the church back there in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a statement from a man who evidently either had lived in, in that period or had talked to his folks about it, and here's what he said. That testimony was read before gatherings of the people, but was evidently destroyed when it met with so much resistance, and the proof of its previous existence can only be had from those who heard it read or was an eyewitness to the consternation that it caused. As I said, I have found documentation of this, including in the Adventist Review of the period. Many tried to live up to her instructions. I sat in the Adventist church in Missoula, Montana, and heard the minister, Roland D. Quinn, get up before the congregation and, with tears streaming down his cheeks, confess that Satan attempted during the dark hours of the night, and he had sinned, but with God's help he would stand firm from now on, only to repeat the scene the following Sabbath. He just couldn't stay away from his wife, poor man. <laughs> One minister told my father he did not dare trust himself at home with his wife, so he had her meet him at the railroad station. <laughs> These poor souls. <laughs> oh, God. oh, man. That reminds me of that, what is it, Timothy, about forbidding to marry and, or, or, or you know, uh, eating a food? Oh, yes, and it calls them lying hypocrites, doesn't it? Yes. Those who forbid marriage. Right, and uh, it's right there in the Bible text. That's right. You know? But uh, from our previous shows, we found that Ellen G. White is almost elevated above scripture in that well, she has yeah. to interpret it. You have to understand, and I think this is very important, every one of these statements by her own teachings and by the teachings of the Adventist Church are straight from God. Now, either God is making errors or something is terrible. Well, she said it herself. It's either from God or it's coming from the right. devil. I think she we gave know where you it's a, coming from. Right. She didn't give you, you know, it's she just one or the other. Choice. That's what she said. Let's go on. We've got some other statements coming up that are fun. <laughs> okay, that's no, down here then. It'd be Sister White taught that the shut door doctrine promulgated from 1844 to around 1851 in which she declared that God had shown her in vision that probation for the world had closed on October 22, 1844. Ellen G. White letter to Joseph Bates, uh, July 13, 1847. Now you had talked about this in some right. detail in show number one of this series. I want to emphasize again, I think this is very important, that for over a hundred years the Adventist Church outright denied that this had happened, that Ellen White had taught, that probation for the world had closed. It wasn't until uh, the early 1970s that they began to say, oh, uh, yes, we've just found out that she knew it. Actually, there were leaders at the top who always knew that she had taught this. Again, it was deceit. Yes, it was... <laughs> Uh, uh, talk about a major doctrine. Think about it. Probation is closed for the world. No one else can be saved. You're either saved or you're not saved. And that's what they taught. Their few dozen were the only people saved mm -hmm. in the whole world back there in 1844, 80, 45, and so on. Now, this doctrine was held for several years, actually. Uh, the White Estate, and I might argue about that, but I can show you shut door statements on up as far as 1851. I'll just pull out one or two here. Yeah, here's up one to 1851, and after that it just started, it started fade disintegrated, away. faded right. away. That's right. Now, here's 1851. The Holy Ghost was poured upon us, and I was taken off in the Spirit to the city of the living God. Then I was shown that the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ relating to the shut door could not be separated. My accompanying angel bade me to look for the travail of soul for sinners as used to be. I looked, but could not see it, for the time of their salvation is past. Mm -hmm. Now, these are terrible statements. I'd like to ask you something. Imagine you were a true Christian back there in 1842, and William Miller comes around preaching that Christ is coming in 1844. You, as a, a really practicing Christian, would have turned to Matthew and said, William Miller, I respect you for the fact that you are a, a conscientious Christian, but you're wrong. Here it is. Christ, well, nobody knows when Jesus is coming. Now, according to the Adventist teaching, you would be lost because you denied the 1844 message. And you believe Matthew 24. But I want to point out something. <laughs> you are biblically correct. William Miller is biblically wrong. And yet, according to the Adventist teachings, you are lost and they are saved. That's right. That's right. 
outright contradiction of uh, the Word of God and, and the whole plan of salvation as presented right. in the Scripture anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, that kind of reminds me of something else I wanted to bring out here in, in a way in that she's saying all kinds of things. Is it true? Is it false? Is it from God? Is it from the devil? Uh, but you're expected as a Seventh-day Adventist to believe everything she says right. because it's all supposed to be coming from God. But uh, with that premise, I, I've got a couple of quotes here I just want to read real quick. Uh, in the uh, Volume 7A of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 907, she makes a statement where she says, Men need to understand that deity suffered and sank under the agonies of Calvary. So she's making a statement in the uh, you know volume 7a of the uh, SDA Bible commentary page 907 and she's saying that you know that men need to understand this that deity suffered and sank under the agonies of Calvary and that's pretty straightforward and uh, some people might have theological problems with that statement she but, contradicts herself about the nature of Christ several times right did you want to go ahead yeah or? I just wanted to say that in that very same Bible commentary and those of you at home can check into this you know just I'm sure there's some, at least a few of you out there might have a, uh, I'm talking about the Seventh-day Adventist, that is, <laughs> have, a, have a, S, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. And once again, it's volume 7A of the SDA Bible commentary. This time, look on page 1129. And what she says is, the deity did not sink under the agonizing tortures of Calvary. <laughs> End quote. So well, you can look on God one page, up again. on 907, she says one thing, and then on page 1129, she says almost exactly the opposite. So the question is, if it's all from God, I guess you have to be some kind of schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Wallace, did you have something else you want to say? Yes, I was going to mention that uh, there are statements from Ellen White where she says that Christ was, li was the second Adam. Mm -hmm. And her statements are very plain and explicit that Christ came here with the same frailties as, shall we say, Adam when he came to the, when he was uh, created on this earth. That, in other words, that Christ had the same propensities to sin that Adam did. It was only because Christ never gave in to those that he was able to go through and overcome. Mm -hmm. That there are other statements which are in conformity with Christian belief, which is that Christ was always God and there was no t propensity to sin. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he did overcome, but there was never this tendency to sin. These, again, have caused Adventists great grief and a lot of confusion. You'll find these statements side by side, for example, in the Adventist quarterlies for their Sabbath school usage sometimes. <laughs> these are just samples of this. So uh, the idea of a prophetess is supposed to bring order from confusion. I think in an earlier show you said everybody outside the Seventh-day Adventist church, the remnant church is like Babylon. Right. And it's confusion. And Makes you it's wonder who's Babylon, doesn't it? Right. Because here you're getting contradictory statements. Uh, they're not clear on the gospel. One place it looks like they're t preaching the gospel. Another place they contradict it. Right. And We've it, got some more of those coming find, out. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and speaking of that, well, let, let's go to our next chart here. On the board, as our viewers at home will see, we come to point two here, which is, did White, that's their prophet, Ellen G. White, ever contradict the Bible? And we've already been kind of touching on this already. We've kind of set the, set the table already. And uh, uh, Wallace, why don't you start uh, running with some of this and uh, let our viewers... This one is very interesting to me as a former Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, Carol and I were both taught as Adventist youth and Adventist academies that all of Christianity believed that Christ was also Michael the Archangel. You may remember that one of the um, tests of a cult is that it has problems with the Godhead. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at this. We were taught, as I said, as youth back there, and I remember in my sophomore year, the teacher standing there saying, well, you know, we were talking about Daniel and Michael mm -hmm. standing up. And he said, well, the entire Christian world agrees that when it says Michael here, it's talking about Jesus Christ. In fact, it wasn't until five months after we left Seventh-day Adventism we were stunned when visiting with some Christian friends to find that Christianity does not teach that. In fact, you as a Seventh-day Adventist believer may be stunned for having me say this. But no, Christianity does not believe that Christ is also Michael. But Alan White teaches that Christ, and she does it several times, that Christ is also Michael. The Bible does not teach that, nor does Christianity. The Bible is very explicit. For example, in Jude night it says that uh, when Michael came down to 
uh, to contend for the, by, the body of Moses, that he didn't dare make accusations against Satan, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. Well, if Michael isn't the Lord, then the Lord has to be someone else, doesn't it? That's Another true. statement, Daniel 10, 13, it says that Michael is one of the chief princes. Now, that makes a perfect description of an archangel. And incidentally, I looked up, if you check your Bible dictionaries, you'll find that archangel is referring to, well, there are four of them among uh, Hebrew, Hebrew um, what do you want to call it there? Their, uh, Hebrew, uh, their, their Hebrew teachings. Teaching, one okay. is Uriel, one is Raphael, one is Gabriel, and one is Michael. And of course, Lucifer had been one previously. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're created beings. Uh, you're talking about the Jewish rabbinical intertestament uh, right. literature, stuff like right. that. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to back you up on this point, because we didn't put it on a chart here, but uh, some of the quotes from uh, Ellen G. White on this subject, as she said, Michael, or Christ, with the angels that buried Moses, came down from heaven after he had remained in the grave a short time and resurrected him and took him to heaven. And then also she says, Likewise, the words of the angel, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, show that he holds a position of high honor in the heavenly courts. When he came with a message to Daniel, he said, There is none that holdeth uh, with me in these things, but Michael, quote, uh, parentheses, Christ, your prince, end quote. So she's uh, basically saying that uh, Michael is Christ. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, well, Adventists teach that. They will fight right. that point to the death. Right. Now let's get to the point B here. It says, was the plan of salvation made before the fall of mankind? The Bible is very specific. There are a lot of texts about that, that they, before mankind ever was, before it was ever, uh, be, and it's long before mankind existed, this plan of salvation had already been made for them. Yeah, like uh, Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the promise before the beginning of time, Titus 1, 2, all those passages. But Ellen White says it was afterwards, after the fall of man. From the great controversy between Christ and Satan book, page 347. Incidentally, it all came out of Milton. She copied from Milton, the Paradise Lost. Oh, now, really? Christ goes in there and talks to God, and God says, no, that's it, they've had it. And Christ oh, wow. goes in again and so on. It, it's well, all copied from Milton. Milton? Yes. What do you know? Just... I guess she found the inspired words of God from uh, oh, yes, the novelist. Uh, it certainly made a great drama. And, and you've got these quotes all documented in this book. Uh, yes. You know, to save time, we don't have to read them all, but uh, the, 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 the documentation is all here for anyone to check out if they, they so desire. C, does God require trespass and sin offerings today? Wallace? Well, the Bible says no, and there are quite a few. There's no need for sin offerings, uh, no need for trespass offerings, etc. Christ is the final offering. But Alan White says something along the lines of, uh, the best thing you can do is bring a trespass offering before the Lord for whatever it is she said that the, whoever was had done. That's right. And then uh, on to, does Christ's blood cancel sin? This is a rather horrifying one to me because it is so important to us. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get this out of here. Page 33. Right, thank you. Uh, the Bible says, yes, here's some example, examples. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Christ also, that, uh, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Holy through his own blood. Here's what Ellen White says. Ellen White said, no, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel sin. It will stand in the sanctuary until the final atonement. That, again, is have it tied in with the 1844 message. That's right. That's right. That's uh, it's a horrifying uh, statement in itself to say yes, that it Christ... Uh, those, blood, those sins, according to them, are still up there staring at us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing because, uh, you know, blessed is he whose who's sin will not be, you know, whose who's righteous, righteousness will, uh, his sins will not be imputed to his case. Or something. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm badly paraphrasing it, but, you know, there's a, a statement that says that your sin, blessed is he whose sins will not be counted against him or something like that, you know. And, and the scripture go on and on about how our sins have been taken by Christ Jesus. He takes the punishment through the shed blood on the cross so that we as sinners can uh, be presented holy and spotless before the throne. Absolutely. And uh, so to take that away is just an outright denial of, uh, of, of the gospel message and right. almost a trampling on of the blood of Christ right. under, under feet. 
Well, anyway, the next one here says, uh, uh, was Christ's atonement completed at the cross? Again, the Bible is very clear. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved through his life. And here's another. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We have received the atonement, a very final specific act. Ellen White says, no. Now, while our great high priest is making the final atonement for us, is making the final atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. There we again, the old, are again, the old perfectionism right. coming out. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, right. do your own works to attain your own righteousness right. apart from a mediator and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let's see what else we've got here on this chart. Apparently, uh, not much uh, more on that line, although you did have another in your book, I noticed, uh, about uh, the question, uh, where did it go here? Here's one I like. Did you bring out the, can Christians say they are saved? Would you like me to go into that or save that? Uh, you can go ahead and bring okay. it up. Can Christians say they are saved? When I was perhaps 10 years old, uh, a friend of mine, Jimmy Heidebrecht, up there in northwest Nebraska, took me to the first Christian church, as I recall. I came home and asked my mother, what does it mean we are saved? We can say we are saved. My mother was very emphatic and very upset. She said, we can never say we are saved. Sister White forbids it. And my mother was correct. Here's the statement from uh, Sister White. Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or feel that they are saved. And in fact, um, at least my experience is, if you ask an Adventist, are you saved? You're going to get a funny look on their face and, uh, well, I hope so. And they're doing what they should do according to their religion. The Bible is very plain. There are a number of statements. Here is one, for example. Uh, Furthermore, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Yes, we have been saved. It's a past tense. It is a past tense. It is a past event. It happened on the cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's another passage, what, First John, th these things were said to, that you may know that you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. You have. We know. You have eternal life. Present tense in that one. That's right. So you get the past and the present. It's pretty good. That's you right. get a double portion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, going on through our, our uh, forest of charts, uh, as time flies on us, uh, what of White's prophecies? And, of course, these are just uh, a few, few more statements by Ellen G. White as we're just analyzing a lot of her different teachings and writings. Well, here we have the deceitful God. Yeah, I have seen, this is 1843, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them. Early writings, page 64, 1882 edition. Then 1844, we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus' coming. Uh, Word to the little flock, page 14, 1847. This all ties in with what you were saying I before. have a testimony from her, uh, one of her visions, in which she said that God's hand hid part of the chart, this 1843 chart. Oh, really? And so, you know, God is up there hiding very relevant parts from mankind. Now, mention this real quickly for our viewers at home. I don't think we mentioned this chart thing before. What? It, what is this 1843 chart for viewers at home? What well, for, I, I'm not really positive specifically about the 1843, but I do know that uh, William Miller for uh, the time taught that uh, Christ uh, might be coming in 1843. Okay, so that's what, uh, that's what she's talking about, right. pretty much the Miller, the, the Miller uh, chronological. Process. This one caused a lot of interest among the Adventist believers. You can, I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, they, were, they were writing her saying, Tell us about this day and hour of Jesus coming. We'd really like to know it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, well, I forgot it. Yeah, she, she, it just slipped her mind. God talks to her and she forgets. And uh, 1849 here. Now time is almost finished, and what we have been six years learning, they will have to learn in months. Right. Early writings, page 57. So apparently she's giving us some kind of time prophecy here that, Less than six years from this date, something's going to happen that 
could be In very short or, months. Well, yeah, or, and then she even lessens it down to, to months. You're it right. It was plain so, and evident from her early writings that they expected Jesus to come within the matter of months. Right. And you know, every time they miss, they just still look for it to keep coming. I mean, for Jesus to come. Yeah. Real soon. If it wasn't that day, it'd be right around the corner. Still. That's right. Yeah. I see. 1856, and you that. already mentioned that before about how she saw someone be alive at the coming of Christ, and of course that was already almost 100 and 150 years ago, and so uh, they're all dead now, and that prophecy was proven to be wrong. And uh, also she had said in 1862 that there's a system of slavery which has ruined our nation is uh, left to live and stir up another rebellion. That's from her early writings from... Uh, page 256 so I, I think it, during the Civil War 18, uh, 1862 she she didn't think that was really going to settle a slavery That's issue right. and that this there'd be another war well, or something like that. that F.D. Nichol immediately said that's a, another of these uh, conditional prophecies. Oh a conditional so. prophecy yeah. okay mm -hmm. I see well uh, anyway there's there's some more evidence why you should you should believe that Ellen G. White's a prophet of God <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Let's go on to another question that was asked on an earlier chart. You had three, uh, three uh, lines of reasoning on how you determine a true prophet. And uh, this one is, did White display the proper ethics required of one who claims to write as a divine messenger? And uh, we've just got some points here. And Wallace, I'd like you to kind of go through those. Right. Okay. Um, I have a statement from uh, Robert Olson of the White Estate that she may have copied over 50% of the great controversy alone. And as you state here, she even copied pictures and tables of contents. In her earlier show, books. you even showed that on, on yes, the, I did. the screen. Without credit. I'd like to point out, however, that Walter Ray has pointed out that um, she extrapolated from many authors on matters of health, history, doctrine, That's the theology. That's oh, Okay, good. And even uh, what she saw in her visions. Um, right. Uh, Jim, uh, James White, uh, some of the things he wrote suddenly showed up in her visions in the Great Controversy. And uh, I'd like to mention here, because we have an, an, a note about uh, the Book of Mormon, that uh, this is relatively new material, sure. and uh, we're, uh, it, it's really a, a, a blockbuster, if you ask me, uh, on this, this particular subject. What we have here is uh, Ellen G. White plagiarizing from Joseph Smith, Jr., the, the, the latter-day prophet of the, the Mormon church. And uh, to get the documentation on this, all you really need is a Book of Mormon, which I'm sure any Mormon missionary will hand you, <laughs> uh, free of charge, as I've had, been handed like six of them now <laughs> over the years. And, uh, but I, I, I like the older ones better because they keep changing it, you know, and they keep trying to get rid of things that they're embarrassed about. And in the newer editions, it's not as good as the older editions where they have a lot of embarrassing uh, facts in the Book of Mormon. But anyway, that's the subject in, in itself. But uh, the, uh, some of the uh, information I have here is that, uh, that, and you may know something about this, uh, Ellen G. White had a vision of the people of God, the Adventist people or something, going down a road that, or some kind of path that gets increasingly narrower and narrower. That was her first vision. Her first vision. And uh, where it gets so narrow that they're finally sc scraping by their fingernails on on mountain cliffs or something and then they have to swing by cords finally to get over to the promised land or something like that. That's but, correct. But what's uh, fascinating about that, and that's coming from uh, her testimonies to the church, volume 2, pages 594 through 597, that, that particular vision. But if you get yourself a Book of Mormon <laughs> and you take a look in there in First Nephi chapter 8, verses... Uh, 19 and following, pretty much going through verse 26, you find almost a parallel vision of a, a group of people going down a narrow path, getting narrow and narrow, until finally they swing over to the promised land on a rod of iron. In that case, it's, in Ellen G. White's vision, it's cords, but in, in the Book of Mormon, it's more like rods of, you know, rod of iron. And uh, you have to wonder, well, uh, Joseph Smith came out with this Book of Mormon in 1830. That's when it was published. And he was killed in Cartilage, Illinois by a mob at a jailhouse in 1844. So he was already dead. The book was already published. 
And if it came down to who's getting their vision from who, I think it's pretty obvious who's, who's getting their vision with a slight change. We get cords instead of a rod of iron. It, it starts to look a little suspicious there as the, uh, I guess in, for once in his life, Joseph Smith Jr. wasn't guilty of stealing these words from Ellen G. White, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I find this to be very shocking material in that if, you, if you're supposedly a vis uh, prophet of God and you get your vision from a false prophet, now, how does, how does the Seventh-day Adventist Church view the Mormon Church? Oh, definitely false. Uh, how false do they look religion? at Joseph Smith, Jr.? As a false prophet. Now, what, what would you say about a true prophet taking almost a complete vision from a false prophet and saying it's from God? Well, Jeremiah is very specific about it. Uh, it therefore declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal. Do we have it up there? Well, I'm looking for it, but you can go ahead and read it. All right. I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. That's Jeremiah 23. Yeah, I found a chart on it. I put it up here on the board. And basically, it's interesting, you know, from Jeremiah 23, he talks about they, they steal my words, and, and basically they steal them from everyone from his neighbor. They're stealing them from each other, these, these false prophets. And, of course, they prophesy false dreams. And they err by their lies. They, you know, God has not sent them nor commanded them. And uh, if this information here is true about Ellen G. White taking visions from a false prophet's visions and then saying it's from God, Jeremiah 23 ties in perfectly with this particular uh, topic. And uh, I'd also like to say that uh, there's other places where uh, it's been documented that uh, Ellen G. White took uh, material from uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, it, it's, it's rather uh, fascinating. She had a dream about a temple. Uh, with, uh, where many people were flocking in and it was supported by a big pillar and, uh, and she went in there and kind of humiliated herself or something like that in this vision well it's interesting if you go into 1st Nephi chapter 8 again and pick up where you left off before at verse 26 and just go on a little further suddenly you have the same thing again you have this big temple with a pillar and a flock of people and and all this kind of stuff, and there's uh, tremendous similarities to that. And she gave that uh, in her early writings on in pages 68 through 71. And you can also find some reference to this in Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, page uh, 623. Uh, and one last, uh, I, I can't resist it, it's too good. If, you, if she's really stealing uh, quotes or visions from a false prophet, who even a Seventh-day Adventist would admit is a false prophet. <laughs> It, it, it's kind of damaging material, you'd have to admit. Uh, also, uh, she says in uh, volume 4, page 251 of Testimonies to the Church, she says, Jesus died not to save man in his sins, but from his sins. But when you look in the Book of Mormon, in the, the book uh, Helaman, chapter 5, uh, verses 9 and 10, it, sa it, it says almost the very same thing not to save him in his sins but from his sins perhaps they were copying from another author they could have been <laughs> they could have been in fact joseph smith could have stolen these visions from somebody else and wondering. then ellen picked them up mm -hmm. and moved on but the uh, the key to this is i think it's very damaging as as we see from what jeremiah is saying about the the false you know the false prophets and so forth i want to add that the adventists don't use the word steal they use the word borrowed oh okay borrow borrowed okay you just kind of changed over a little bit i would like to say one last thing we can bring this chart up you know speaking about false prophets and stuff this one always sends a shiver up my spine when you're talking about uh, lying prophets false prophets but it's ezekiel chapter 14 verse 10 it says and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity now he's talking about false prophets. If you're into Ezekiel 14 all through there, he's talking about mm -hmm. false prophets. Now he's talking about the punishment they'll get for their iniquity. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh 
unto him. Now, here's people, let's say, that are sincere in Seventh-day Adventists. Let's say, hypothetically, <laughs> L.G. White's a false prophet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's people that are sincere. They really believe she's a true prophet. And they're seeking after her. But it turns out she's a false prophet. Now, do they get a break for that because they're sincere? Or do what we read here in Ezekiel 14 is that they were going to get the same punishment that the false prophet's going to get because they sought after Follow a false prophet. Mm -hmm. So even though this prophet up here may be a willingly, knowingly lied, deceived, led people astray, but because people were sincere in being, you know, in being led astray, they will get the same punishment as the one that willingly deceived them. Now so that's be, pretty scary. better be very careful who they follow. <laughs> exactly. Now that is very scary. So mm -hmm. sincerity is not going to cut it. <laughs> and one last thing I'd like to say is 1 John uh, 4, 1 says, he gives the warning, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Mm -hmm. that's right. So See, uh, talking about Ezekiel 14, 10, it's also making those people false prophets. Exactly. Because they promote it. They support it. Mm -hmm. And now we've only got about five minutes left to go. And I'd like to kind of finish up this chart that we have here that we were on. We were right uh, down in this area about uh, promiscuous copying and stuff. And I think, uh, Wallace, we're ready to go on with uh, C. We've got right. about five minutes. So let's see if we can finish this chart off. Well, you know. well, Walter Ray has amassed inescapable evidence that much of her work was compiled by secretaries, family members, and the likes. In fact, uh, could you hold up that book? Uh, yes, white I have. lie? Because uh, we haven't shown it since show, show number one, so any new viewers. This is my much-used copy of it here. <laughs> yes, The White Lie by Walter Ray. He's documented all the copying. It's all there for anyone to, to research and find. And wow. Walter Ray uh, was very instrumental in yeah, many of the things through. we learned. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. with that established, go on with what you're, you were about to say. Well, I was going to say that one book uh, was a actually came out a year after she was dead. Now, that's pretty good work for a it. person to do it. You can do it. Uh, she, you don't happen to know the title of that one. I'm often. trying to think. Yes, I believe it was uh, Prophets and Kings. Prophets and Kings came yes. out a year after she was dead. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it is, has been frankly admitted by the White Estate that, uh, in fact, the term, I believe, comp compilation was used in much of it. And many of the so-called books that have come out since then, you know, they like to talk about the 25 million words that uh, she wrote. Mm -hmm. But uh, the woman was very, uh, a very tremendous writer. She di did write a lot. There's no getting around that, no arguing about it. Mm -hmm. However, in many cases, what has happened for these new books that are constantly coming out of this Ellen White um, message is that they will compile they've got these fanatic compilers in the white estate that will go through and say we need a book about uh, young high school age for young high school age students so they'll go through and they'll compile all these statements and they'll put them together and they suddenly have a new book out by Ellen G. Oh, White so there's an awful lot of this going on but yes there's no question uh, the okay. white estate hasn't That's even bothered to deny that to my okay we got about two minutes left and what i'm going to do is just run through this quickly then and right. let you make some comments on it uh, so much of her work was compiled by secretaries and family members white along with her descendants denied almost all copying of others materials uh, the seventh day adventist church has hidden facts okay very briefly uh, here's a arthur white statement to Ellen White, W.C. White, and Ellen White's literary staff, there was no dishonesty, no deceiving of the people in the manner in which her work was done. But Arthur's father, I believe it was his father, Ellen's son, Willie, wrote privately, in the early days of her work, Mother was promised wisdom in the selection of, from the writings of others that would, a, would enable her to select the gems of truth from the rubbish of error. We have all seen this fulfilled, and yet when she told me of this, she admonished me not to tell it to others. <laughs> Keep it quiet. Keep, Keep it quiet. in the family. That's right. Now, number E, or letter E, Wright held herself above the health rules she imposed so strictly on her followers. And you would mentioned this before right. about the shellfish. or Yeah. Uh, well, Ellen letter. spoke very strongly and was telling others, no way are you allowed to have um, uh, meat or milk, eggs, uh, th this sort of thing on the table. Mm -hmm. And yet we have her own granddaughter's statement that these were there. Mm -hmm. We also know that she had shellfish, that she ate those, she ate pork sandwiches. And we also have statements from the White Estate recently that uh, she was eating meat right up into the 1890s, years after she was telling everybody else she had long since quit it. Mm -hmm. 
sounds like a definition of a hypocrite to me. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, F here, she never repented for dishonesty. She so we never, know she, never uh, she knowingly lied, uh, deceived, uh, said that she wasn't copying when she was, and ate food she wasn't supposed to be eating, when, you know, all these kind of things, and we go on and on, but there's no time left. Right. So I'd like you to take just a few seconds, say something from the heart to Seventh-day Adventists that may be watching, and then we'll sign off. To the Adventist believer, I would say, Jesus died for your sins. His sacrifice is all, in, all atoning. Once you are saved, you are saved, and you can go on with your belief. The, what is left is the uh, work of sanctification, and that is simply one of the fruits that will work in you to make your life a living memorial to the great work Christ does. Yes. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not a, a keeping the Sabbath and doing a bunch of works. Believe on his name and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16.31. Well, anyway, thank you for being with us. Uh, join us again next time as we continue in this series on Seventh-day Adventism. May the Lord be with you. God bless. Bye-bye. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Thank you for being with us in this special program that we're doing today on a very special topic. The topic is Seventh-day Adventism, and uh, I think you'll find it of great interest. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and uh, I've got some very special guests with me today that are going to assist me in analyzing this particular topic. I'd like to uh, introduce them right now. Uh, it's a husband and wife, Wallace and Carol Slattery. From uh, what is it, Langhorne, Pennsylvania? That's correct. Uh, is that uh, near any big cities in Pennsylvania we would know near about? Near Philadelphia. Near Philadelphia. Okay. Well, uh, uh, if our viewers have been with us over the last few weeks, they're already familiar with you. But uh, I'll just give a little background, and uh, uh, Wallace, I'd like you to say a few more words here, both of you. Uh, but basically, uh, Wallace, you've written a book. I think I have it right here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's called "Our Seventh Day Adventists: False Prophets." A former insider speaks out. And this book has uh, 
excellent documentation in the concern of Seventh-day Adventist religion, particularly uh, documentation on their, their uh, co-founder and prophetess, Ellen G. White. Now, with that said, Wallace and Carol, uh, could you just briefly, since this is already show number four and we have new material that we want to get into, uh, just give a little of your background and for reasons for writing the book and, and, and so forth on Seventh-day Adventist. Carol, go ahead. All right. Uh, Carol and I were both lifelong Seventh-day Adventists. We both came out of Seventh-day Adventist families. It wasn't until the 1970s, uh, when I was a worker for the Adventist denomination, that we began to realize that there were problems. And over the next seven years, we researched uh, Seventh-day Adventism in the light of a lot of information that was coming out. And the final result was that we came out of Adventism in 1984. Uh, leaving it for evangelical Christianity. Uh, I felt that there was so much information that was coming out that so many Adventists didn't know about or that the general Christian world didn't know about that it really was deserving of a, um, a book. So with Carol's great cooperation and help and encouragement, uh, I spent the next several years writing this little book that you just described, and uh, the book is now available. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Carol at least from in our series earlier, it was very difficult for you to come out of Seventh-day Adventism. So the information that uh, Wallace has found that's in this book uh, must be pretty strong evidence if it were convinced someone like yourself to, to leave a religion you grew up in. Is this true? Yes, that's true. In fact, when he first came home and said he was having trouble with Ellen White, which is the Adventist prophet, I was very upset. I thought he was really rebellious, and I was, I was very upset, and um, I wanted to know more. So you were a very strong set of the Adventists, and you weren't just a wishy-washy time that could be easily swayed out of your religion. No, I had grown up in it. I believed everything. My parents were workers in the church, and I was very much a devoted Seventh-day Adventist. So the, the, the preponderance of evidence was very strong to shake your your foundational sure beliefs not. in that organization. And that's what we've been pretty much showing in this series uh, so far. We're going to get into it some more here in just a moment. But just as a very quick uh, overview for our new viewers, Wallace, uh, we've got uh, a chart here on the, on the board. I've got a photograph just for newer viewers, our older viewers <laughs> who've watched some of our other shows have already seen this. But we've got a picture of Ellen G. White and her husband, uh, James, and if you could just give a very brief synopsis of the Adventist history, where they come from, and then we'll move into the new topic. Well, certainly. Very briefly, Adventism came out of the Millerite movement, which believed that Christ would come in 1844. When he didn't, Adventism, under the leadership of Alan White, who claimed to be, or to have the spirit of prophecy, mm -hmm. um, con continued to regroup and grow and prosper into the large worldwide church it is today of over six million, perhaps seven million, and very rapidly expanding. Um, Ellen White is, shall we say, the um, cornerstone, I believe, of Seventh-day Adventism. And I might add that uh, over these last three tapes, we've spent considerable time showing that, number one, Adventism's claims for her are much beyond what a Christian church should ever claim for any founder or guiding light. We also held her up to three biblical tests. Uh, number one, uh, does she say things that come true or are the uh, things that are correct? Number two, does she contradict the Bible? And number three, does she... Uh, Engage in ethical... And how were her ethics? That's, That's correct. Went blank there for a second. <laughs> and we found conclusive evidence that she fell far short in all of these tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically her and her husband, James, uh, co-founded this in the 1860s somewhere. That's you know? correct. And the Seventh-day Adventist uh, organization has been with us ever since. So this is an organization that's not even 200 years old yet. But uh, in a previous show, I think you just said that they've got something called a remnant mentality where they believe they're the only ones that will be saved. Is that correct? Everyone else is Babylon outside of their organization? At least at the end, they believe that uh, at the very time of the end that the, it will come down to a question of Sabbath observance, whether you're going to keep Saturday for the Sabbath or if you're going to keep Sunday. They believe that there will be a worldwide law passing requiring everyone to keep Sunday. Okay. And uh, that, at, at that time, this will be the question that has come up. 
And um, so it, it comes down, and this is basically what, what we want to get into uh, here in this program in more detail is uh, the Sabbath keeping these commands of the Seventh day Adventists uh, of, of this Seventh day observance of the, of the Sabbath day. And now, from what I was hearing you just say just then, it almost sounded like this is almost a condition for salvation that you keep the Sabbath. And it's almost like if you don't, you're lost, but if you do, at least you've got a chance to be saved. The Sabbath is the testing truth for Adventists. Okay, now with that uh, said, let me uh, bring up a, a verse out of the Bible that seems to tie in with this. It's in uh, Revelation 12, 17. Does that sound like a familiar verse? That's to you a real Adventist text. And uh, what that verse says is in Revelation 12, 17, it says, And the, the dragon was wroth. Well, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, from what we've already discussed here in these brief moments, it sounds like uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church are claiming this remnant uh, word that I just read here in this text. They're the themselves. remnant church. And then it, it goes on to say, which keep the commandments of God. And so they tie, I guess, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments that Moses brought to the, the children of Israel, and say, well, we keep the Ten Commandments. And because we do that, and we're the remnant seed, and at this last time, or something like this, they're, they're the ones that will be redeemed. So is that a proper exegesis of the Adventist uh, point of view on Very this nice. text? So basically, we're, we're looking at the Sabbath day on this stuff. Uh, what I'd like to do at, at this moment is, is uh, bring up some of their arguments for the Sabbath day and, uh, and then also get into some of this commandment stuff. Uh, in fact, before I get into uh, a lot of these, uh, these uh, arguments that the uh, Seventh-day Adventists bring for their, their per position on the Sabbath, because I have a feeling I might forget uh, about the commandment thing I want to bring up uh, later on in the program because sometimes we get going and, and I may forget to cover it later. So I want to just cover it real quick here for our viewers. When we look at the commandments here, uh, it seems to me there's an assumption in Revelation 12, 17 that the commandments are the Decalogue. That's correct. Uh, they are pre presupposing that that's talking about the Ten Commandments, Sabbath keeping, all the rest of it. But uh, I would like to, to direct our, our viewers' attention to... Uh, 1 John chapter 5, which, uh, which in verses 2 and 3. And what it says there is, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. In verse 3 it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Now, I, I bring up uh, 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, and it sounds like no Adventist would have any trouble with that whatsoever. That's right. In fact, say, I've had them quote it. Yes. They say, oh, well, let, see, that just proves it even, even more. Proves it even more. Uh, but the key to this understanding what John's talking about on commandments, because after all, he wrote Revelation also, as well as right here where I'm reading from 1 John chapter 5. The key is to understand the overall meaning of what John was trying to put forth when he said commandments. What did he mean when he said that? Did he mean the Ten Commandments? And, and, and the key to that is to go to 1 John chapter 3. See, you want to read everything in context. Don't just take a passage here and a passage there and just feed meaning into it. That's called eisegesis. You take a, a passage and you feed meaning into it the way you want it to, to read rather than taking an exegetical view of the, the passage, which is to look at it in overall context with other passages of relevant Scripture. Okay, 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. It says, uh, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, what are the commandments? The, well, he's going to give us the answer in verse 23, right here in 1 John 3. Here's what he's talking about when he's talking about commandments. Verse 23, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Amen. Now, uh, uh, in verse 24 it says, 
And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Now, you're sitting there listening. Does this sound like uh, he just told us what he's talking about when he uses the word commandment? I agree. <laughs> uh, it didn't sound to me like he's saying Ten Commandments there. He's saying the commandment uh, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And as you get into the Greek text, this is where it gets a little more technical here, but whenever uh, uh, John was talking about the Ten Commandments or the, the commandments given in the Old Testament, the laws of Moses and stuff. When he was writing his, his books in the New Testament, in the Greek he'd always reference to them, he's talking about Moses and the Old Testament stuff, the commandments there, he would use the, the Greek word nomos. I think that's O-N-O-M-O-U-S. Okay, but if he weren't talking about those Old Testament uh, commandments and things out of Moses, in the Greek text, in the New Testament, if he were talking about something other than those things, teachings and so forth. He would he would use a uh, Greek word uh, called, I'll have to check it here, antile, antile. And uh, that pretty much meant teachings or something that's now we find in the New Testament is given by Christ. Hmm. And so that's another way to get at the heart of this matter. Check it back in the Greek and you'll find that the Apostle John makes a distinction of what he's talking about when it comes to these commandments straight from the Greek text. So I wanted to get that in now because I know as we get into this stuff, we, we could forget about it. I could forget bringing all this stuff up later and it might leave some questions, but I wanted to get that answered. But we want to get back now to the Sabbath and let Wallace do some talking for a change <laughs> as the opportunity is there. But uh, now Wallace, what I'm going to do is bring up some uh, typical, I guess these would be arguments, that the Seventh-day Adventists would would uh, bring into play to try to prove that the Sabbath day is something you still need to, to, to do, uh, particularly in regards to keeping your salvation. And then I'm going to just throw these out to you and uh, let you and Carol just say what you want to say on these things. Okay, point one here I've got, uh, God sanctified the seventh day at creation. And they like to tie in with that, that the patriarchs, they claim, kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, I'd like to point out first, and this will tie in with some of the things I'm going to say very briefly and shortly here, that uh, God, it doesn't say that God commanded Adam or Noah or any of those other patriarchs to keep the Sabbath. It simply says he celebrated and went on. I think a good analogy would be uh, man's landing on the moon. Uh, mankind celebrated it and went on. It is not a national holiday we continue to observe today. Uh, when you get into the study of the patriarchs, which would be people following right after Adam here, uh, you as a Seventh-day Adventist are going to be stunned, I believe, to find out that uh, there is no mention whatever of them keeping the law. In fact, I have some verses I'd like to put up here and get into them. Here we go, the top one here first. <clears throat> the Bible basically states that the forefathers did not have the law. Let's take a look at some of these. The first one there. Uh, the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb, that's Sinai. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. That's Deuteronomy 5, 2, and 4. Notice it wasn't with their ancestors the Lord made this covenant. Now Paul reinforces this with the second one, the second verse there. Paul in Galatians 3.17 says, The promises were spoke to, spoken to Abraham. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previous, previously established by God. You know, you can see that Paul is stating that the law was introduced 430 years later after uh, the time of Abraham's covenant, for example. So Abraham didn't have the law. I believe the next one's up there, too. Nehemiah 9... Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I have another one here that ties in with this. So Nehemiah 9, 13 to 15. You came down in Mount Sinai. 
You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees and commands and laws through your servant Moses. Now, uh, let's take a look about the Sabbath. Look at the bottom one here. This is uh, Ezekiel here, isn't it? This yes, is Ezekiel, Ezekiel speaking. 20. This is God talking to Ezekiel. Therefore, I led them out of Egypt and brought them into the desert. I gave them my decrees and made known to them my laws. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us so that they would know that I, the Lord God, made them holy. God gave Israel the Sabbath as a sign. Excellent. So uh, I have one more. Let me give it up here. Let's see. Uh, this is the Lord talking to Moses. Say to the Israelites, because uh, you must observe my Sabbaths. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it uh, for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. Oh, excellent. Well, I think that uh, <laughs> covers that pretty well. Uh, how would you deal with this one, Wallace? The uh, Ten Commandments were intended for all mankind. That's a popular one with the Seventh-day Adventists. Let's uh, put this up. You might be interested in learning that actually the Jews did not teach this. In fact, there was sentiment among the rabbis that any non-Jew who tried to keep the Sabbath should be put to death. So they, they felt it was a very exclusive uh, uh, privilege to keep the Sabbath, if you wish to call it that. But let's take a look. This is the, uh, sa this is the uh, Ten Commandments as given in Deuteronomy 5. Notice how it reads. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Notice, it is a sign again between God and Israel. Uh, I might point out something else. The Ten Commandments were a divine adaptation to the times. I'd like to point out, for example, that the um, uh, Ten Commandments refer to um, pack animals, to manservants, woman servants. Uh, some verses even call these uh, man slaves and, and uh, woman slaves. Mm -hmm. Another thing, the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. What land is God talking about? Yes. Canaan. Mm -hmm. that's a, oh, that's the a promised point. land. I never thought about that. That's a very local situation. Okay. And uh, do you want to bring in this other verse that you have? We'll come to it. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. Then let's uh, go on then with another, another argument. The Decalogue is a supreme law of the universe, they say. Oh, yes. They, the only real evidence that Adventism likes to pull out about this is they have this verse in uh, Isaiah 66, uh, 23, where Adventism takes the statement from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me. Now, I'd like to point out that this is a... If you take a look at the context of this, number one, it is talking about from one new moon and from one Sabbath to another. New moons are ceremonial. Mm -hmm. Second, we're talking, and if you look at the context, it's very plain about this is a conditional promise God is giving Israel. In fact, he says, if you don't do these things, these good things won't happen to you. But he's talking about the idyllic state Israel will live in if it continues or if it will just follow God and worship him as their ruler. Right. Okay. Uh, what about Jesus? Uh, Jesus kept the Ten Commandments. So it doesn't oh, yeah. apply to everyone, they, they would say. Yeah, yes. In fact, uh, they love to quote these verses, and there are some good verses about it, such as, you know, uh, uh, until, what is it, uh, not one jot and tittle will pass away until these things are done. Mm -hmm. um, they also like to bring out that Jesus uh, told his followers, pray that your flight from Jerusalem, when the time comes, won't come on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. And all of these things are correct. Now, it is a fact, isn't it, that Jesus was born a Jew. Here on earth, he was circumcised. He kept the law generally. I think he drove the uh, Jewish rabbis into a frenzy sometimes with his observance of it. <laughs> but um, it was being kept in a general sense. Uh, so, you know, he really didn't, although he was contradicting it, he wasn't making a major issue of it at that point, was he? But Jesus also said, 
I have much more to say to you, this is his disciples, than you can bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, comes, uh, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus is simply saying there's a lot more you people are going to be learning. And if you compare uh, the way Jesus, would, uh, shall we say, and his followers were leading their lives with the way the Christian church of, say, 30 years hence mm -hmm. was, uh, was uh, living, you can see tremendous changes. Yes. Jesus really broke the logjam of the times. Mm -hmm. And we can all be so thankful that this all happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, go ahead. Well, uh, is that all you want to say on that particular I point? wanted to say one more thing. I think this is rather significant. And this is about... Pray not, you know, that your flight from Jerusalem will right. be on the Sabbath. Uh, if you check history, you'll find that the people who took over uh, Jerusalem when the Romans were attacking were zealots, extreme radicals. They didn't. They were observing the law to the letter. And if uh, there had been a large-scale, burden-bearing exodus of Jewish Christians on the Sabbath, uh, there would have been the harshest of penalties uh, perpetrated upon them. I really don't think you can use that. That's a good point. Now, uh, I think this was even mentioned in a, a, a live radio show we did last night before this taping. Uh, you mentioned something about how an argument that's used by Seventh-day Adventists is uh, that the apostolic church kept the Sabbath day and, and all these kinds. In fact, you, I, didn't you mention some kind of documentation that it's been a, a long time thing that they supposedly had some evidence that the, the early church kept the Sabbath for two or three hundred years after Christ and then it faded away. I have some great stuff coming up on that. Let's, let's okay. get back to what I think the Adventists would be referring to in this case okay. is, shall we say, the Pauline church, the church of Peter, this sort of oh, thing. Oh, the actual uh, right, you know, right, The uh, Pentecostal period. Okay. Uh, it is a fact that um, the early Christians were, of course, Jewish. Mm -hmm. They continued to go to the, church, to the uh, temple uh, they observed the law, their children were circumcised, and so forth. They obviously really did not, did not understand what Christianity was leading into. Mm -hmm. uh, however, as you know, the Bible is very plain in Acts. Uh, uh, Gentiles began converting, and the questions began coming up. Well, should these people uh, can keep the law? Should they follow the circumcision and all this sort of uh, rigmarole that the Jews were coming through with? Um, it is very obvious that, I believe it was in um, Acts 15, isn't it, where, you know, these, the Jews came to these people and said, you've got to be circumcised and do all these things. And they had the first, uh, to use an Adventist term, general conference <laughs> at that point. And the results were that uh, they came out with what they felt that uh, the early Gentile Christians should do. And these can be read in Acts 15, verses 20 to 30. And yeah, they, there was only like four things that they thought were... That's right. You know, uh, Number abstain. one... Okay, you're going to write I've got them. Go ahead. Abstain from food offered to idols. Mm -hmm. Two, abstain from meat from strangled animals. Three, abstain from sexual immorality. And I'm going to come back to that one because that's kind of neat. That's basically it. This actually, when you think about it, re um, amounts to a renunciation of the Torah. Because it's saying... You only have to do these things. If you're handling these, you're, you're doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, as Paul wrote, circumcision has value if you value the law. But if you don't value the law, you're not concerned about circumcision. Mm -hmm. That was in Romans 2.25. Well, Adventism has always argued, well, this just had to do with, uh, you know, the ceremonial law. But I'd like to point out that what was rule number three? Abstain from sexual immorality. Where do you get that? Yeah. That's the seventh commandment. That's it. So you see, it is a general overview of what they felt was required of Christians based on what God would uh, want of us uh, from A to Z. It, it kind of reminds me of what that uh, Jesus asked, what are the, the greatest commandments or something? That's right. That's good. Yeah. I'd like to point out also that the believers were specifically exempted from all other aspects of the Torah. And you'll find that in Acts 28, 15, verses 28 and 29. Now, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the Hebrew Jews became more and more insular. Mm -hmm. They became a smaller and smaller group. Uh, these would be the Nazarenes and the Ebionites. I won't go into the difference. There is a slight difference between them. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they died out. In fact, I understand that they were absorbed into Islam, which is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. However, look at the Gentile church. It, because of the fact that it had left these things behind, it blossomed and became the wonderful 
force for truth that it is in the world today. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay, uh, well, you're doing a great job on these uh, answering these uh, arguments. Uh, I guess after 40 or more years hearing them, uh, it's kind of nice to have some answers to these things. Well, when you've been dealing with this for 51 years, I'd like to mention one more thing, and I would like to point this out to the Seventh-day Adventist believer. Take your Bible and read all the Pauline epistles. They're beautiful and they're wonderful. They're dynamite without uh, the Ellen White interpretation of them. <laughs> and notice that again and again when Paul is scolding people, find one place where Paul says, this should be, I mean, you're doing wrong because you're not observing the Sabbath. Think about it. Gentiles were coming into the church in droves. Whereas you would think that, you know, they would really need schooled in all the ins and outs of Sabbath keeping. Mm -hmm. Whereas one instance where Paul says, you need to learn to observe the well, Sabbath. As you better. just mentioned in Acts 15, they said, well, the Gentile, just, just make sure they do these few things and they'll be well, okay. <laughs> there are so many arguments against I'll give another one really quickly here. The Roman world had a huge slave population. We know that the slaves converted to Christianity in droves. And by the way, it is mentioned that these slaves would get up early on Sunday morning, they would have a worship service, this is mentioned specifically, and then they would go on with their work. Where is one instance of all these slaves, and so many were martyred, many, many were martyred, where is one instance where one slave was brought up on charges because he refused to work on Saturday. <laughs> What That's a Paul great point. I never thought about that. Any other? He stole my thunder. That was coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Now uh, let's uh, go on to the next next argument that they would make, which is the law is divided into the moral law and the ceremonial law. Well, this is interesting because this has been used by Sunday Sabbatarians for many years to advance the cause of Sunday keeping. Mm -hmm. I, I think, however, it's interesting that uh, the word nomos, which Paul uses, is actually the word, is the Greek counterpart of the word Torah, the Hebrew word Torah, and I don't think there's any question that Torah is referring to the, seventh day, uh, to the uh, Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the Moral Law. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the Bible is very plain in a number of verses, such as uh, Galatians 3, 10 through 13, that any infraction of any part of the Torah is an infraction of the entire Torah. Mm -hmm. So you simply can't restrict uh, these to one or the other. Uh, is that all you had to say on that point? I wanted to bring up a point here. Real sure, quick. go right ahead. But basically, I just wanted to say to our, our, our viewers out there also that there's an excellent little article that uh, our executive director of the Research and Education Foundation has done, Dr. Robert Morey. Here it is. Is Sunday the Christian Sabbath? You had mentioned it sort of there, and I was looking for an opportunity to get this in. <laughs> so this is available, and uh, Dr. Morey deals in, in his typical scholarly fashion with a lot of these same arguments that uh, Brother Slattery is bringing out here. And uh, if you're interested in something that deals specifically with this question about Sabbath-keeping arguments for and against, uh, this is available through our organization. You want to get a little commercial in there. <laughs> okay, great. Let me mention two more things with Paul. Here's, uh, there's so many. Paul has many statements, but here are a couple. This is Colossians 2, verses 2 through 14. I'll just read parts of it. Have it canceled the written code, written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Here's Ephesians 2.15. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. Here's uh, Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the results of our ministry, written not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. It is so specific and clear. And I would suggest to you, Seventh-day Adventist believer, uh, get your Bible out, read the epistles of Paul. They are specific and explicit concerning these points. Okay, now you just mentioned Colossians chapter 2 right there. One of the right. arguments the Seventh-day Adventists would make on that is the Sabbaths at Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 were only ceremonial Sabbaths. You know, if you'll check that out, you'll find that um, it, ta it, ta it talks in sequence of festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. It is unanimously agreed, even among SDA commentators, that this implies yearly, monthly, and, sequ and weekly sequences. Well, if that's so, then it has been uh, done away with. Mm -hmm. uh, this appear the same sequence appears five times, incidentally, in the Old Testament, always having to do with the so weekly, having to do with the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now what about uh, Paul speaking in, uh, in, out in favor 
of the law in, let's say, the book of Romans. Paul is much more uh, positive about the law in Romans than he is elsewhere. He's speaking to a uh, mixed Jew uh, Jewish and Gentile congregation there. Evidently, there was strife, uh, strife about what, uh, whether the law should be kept or not. Paul had to be careful there with whom he was dealing with. And it is interesting that when Paul would go to a Gentile com or Jewish community, he seemed to attend the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, their local synagogue on the Sabbath and so forth. Paul was out there to make converts, not to offend uh, the local gentry. And he does speak more positively about that. He has relegated the law to obsolescence. Take a look at Romans 10, 4 through 10. He continues to observe it in faith and love. Now, I have a beloved wife here, if I can give a sort of an analogy. Carol understands that the Bible says that uh, there is nothing wrong with eating flesh foods. She understands that it's perfectly acceptable by the Bible. Mm -hmm. However, because of the fact of her, her upbringing, uh, what would happen if I offered you a nice hamburger? <laughs> I'd give it back. <laughs> right. In fact, we just, uh, before we filmed this, uh, I, I had to have a hamburger, a Whataburger, and uh, you, uh, you being a vegetarian, did not want to eat meat and had a salad instead. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, as I read, uh, I believe it's Colossians 2 and also Romans 14, that there's no problem. And either way, you can either be a meat eater or a, a vegetarian, and right. there's no condemnation you found the in the scripture. You have freedom to eat what you want. That's exactly. Right. That's exactly. what Paul says in Romans 14. Let me read it to you very briefly, and I believe I have this here. You have to put it up. It's beautiful. Okay. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. We're the chart board. And uh, I'll hold it up here. Now, this is Romans, and this is Paul basically saying, let there be some religious tolerance on this. Look at this. Uh, this is Romans 15, 14, verses 5, 6, and 13. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Now, uh, Larry, you'll be interested in knowing that one of the things that Carol and I have noticed about Adventism and so many other uh, religions that have real problems with uh, the basics of Christianity is that they tend to major in minors and minor in majors. Exactly. Uh, there, it seems to us that there's a real de-emphasis of the gospel and justification mm -hmm. in Seventh-day Adventist uh, churches and a tremendous emphasis, over-emphasis on these minor points. Paul basically is saying, Let, let's forget these little things and let's get on to the major thing. The major thing is Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it, it's such a clear-cut pattern in the cults when you have the, the majoring in minors and, and on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the, the major things, it's kind of relegated to something that you don't see much of. But of course, this we know is uh, typically one of Satan's devices in order to take people's eyes off of Christ and what he's done and put it on these these lesser important details. Like smoke screens. Yes, yeah, smoke screens. Now we've got a, just a couple of quick points here left on the Sabbath thing and then you'd mentioned the gospel and I would like Can't to Can't wait get to into get into it. it. That's my favorite. Yes, and uh, I'm not quite sure how much time we have left but we're going to get that in no matter what it takes, I guess. Uh, uh, I understand we have about 15 minutes. Okay, great. And uh, to finish off the Sabbath thing, and I want to make sure we try to cover as many of their arguments for the sake of the viewers out there as we can and hear it from mm -hmm. you, uh, an excellent speaker on this subject. Okay, and we covered it at some point already at the beginning of the show out of Revelation 12, 17, a favorite SDA proof text on commandments and stuff like that. But just to rehash it just a little bit and let you say what you like on it, they say that Revelation teaches that the remnant church keeps the commandments. Yes, they do. And uh, But it's interesting that John, who wrote the Revelation, is the one who was also um, inspired by God to write what the new commandments were. And of course, Jesus mentioned these too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, worship God and uh, love each other. Right. Uh, John mentions anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Uh, he also says, I ask that we love one another. And of course, a new commandment I give you, love one another. 
Mm -hmm. uh, those who keep the commandments of God, if you look into Revelation, are further described as those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Christ himself, therefore, is the law of the Christian. You'll find that in Romans 10.4. Excellent, excellent. And then we, I touched on it maybe prematurely a while ago, but we'll let you expound a little more on it now. You, but it's so much fun. You, uh, you really did great on this last night on a, tele, a radio show uh, on this subject, but I'll just bring it up and let you answer it all over again. Uh, the early Christian church practiced the Sabbath. They kept the Sabbath through, I think, uh, two or, for the first two or three hundred years after Christ. What do you have to say about that? This is an absolute falsehood, and I was taught that, Carol was taught that, all Seventh-day Adventists are taught that they were all a bunch of sabotagers for at least two or three hundred years after Jesus. Actually, there is documented evidence that as early as perhaps 65 A.D., that uh, there were Christian congregations, for example, I believe it was in Antioch, that were uh, meeting together on Sunday, and they were contrasting it with the Jewish practice of sabotizing. See Mervyn Maxwell, and of course, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist viewer, you know that name. Uh, I was privileged to have the man as a, a teacher. He's a very highly respected Seventh-day Adventist theologian. Mm -hmm. He wrote a, um, a syllabus uh, called History of the Sabbath and Sunday, which is required reading, I understand, for seminary students out at the Adventist University of Andrews. And uh, let me give you some very quick uh, quotes from this thing. Uh, in our study, we discovered that the fourth commandment was largely disregarded by Gentile Christians even as early as the beginning of the century, second century, that would be 100 A.D., and even in the vicinity of so apostolic community as the church of Ephesus. Going on, we have so many statements. What it boils down to is that Mervyn Maxwell is stating that there is no good evidence for widespread Sabbath-keeping, even in the very early years. Uh, Here's that and one. And it's all documented. It's all documented. Uh, there is no they evidence write, for they it. They can write to you on this. Yes, I have a copy document. of this syllabus. It will blow the average Adventist Would you like to them. give your address? Real Certainly quick? I would. And I might mention that uh, this book is available, Our Seventh-day Adventist uh, False Prophets. Uh, you can contact me at uh, uh, Stepping Stone Ministries, Box L1124, Langhorne, Pennsylvania. 19047. The book are seven. Dollars postpaid, and if you will contact me personally, I'll see to it that you can also get a copy uh, of uh, Mervyn Maxwell's uh, syllabus on it. Uh, there are so many others. Here's another statement: uh, Does the lack of controversy among the early fathers indicate they all kept the Sabbath? Going on, the four most noteworthy authors who dealt with the Sabbath in the second and thir early third centuries, Barnabas, Justin, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, reveals a great unanimity of attitude in respect to the literal Sabbath. To a man, they oppose it. You know, we keep talking about keeping the Sabbath, but when one has kept the Sabbath for so many years, you have to have a powerful argument to not keep it anymore. And... The Seventh-day Sabbatarians say that we must not uh, rest one day in seven, but on the very day of the week on which God rested after he created the earth. And I think the best way to decide um, on an untenable thesis is to go to its logical end. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what keeping the Sabbath uh, really means. Where does the uh, sun first rise? <laughs> is it in Palestine? <laughs> is it in Greenwich? It, it, or is it the international date line? Which mm -hmm. is, by the way, an arbitrary line, mm -hmm. not even a straight line. So it would be hard. It, it would be hard to keep. <laughs> you know, we keep talking about keeping the Sabbath, but when you really boil it down, what is keeping the Sabbath and how is this possible? Mm -hmm. Because the international date line was fixed by an international community, and it's an arbitrary line. Huh. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Now, it, another thing, if, if we followed uh, the letter of the law, just like, like we're talking about, a couple interesting facts is that the Australians and all the others on the same side of the international date line would keep the Sabbath after instead of before it is kept in the Western world. 
And according to this reasoning, Sunday would be the Australian seventh day. So the fact of calling any 24-hour period the seventh day is both arbitrary and imaginary. Imaginary. Those are some good points. Just using logic. That's mm -hmm. logic. And, and applying it to this Sabbath mm -hmm. understanding. Ellen White had a very logical comment on the uh, on, on the Sabbath keeping in the North Pole or the polar regions. Would you like to no, uh, share that? No, there's problems. Let's say you want to keep the Sabbath and you're an astronaut. What do you do? Or what if you're on a boat out in the middle of the ocean? What do you do? <laughs> well, what about the Arctic? Well, I have you that mean right. Ellen G. White, the Seventh Day Adventist prophetess, had something to say about keeping the Sabbath. Oh, yes. oh yes. She, yes. If you're in, in the Arctic, Arctic, in the Arctic, or the Antarctic, yes. Well, this now ought to be fascinating. Yes. Says, and what are Sabbath? What she had to say. And what are Sabbatarians <laughs> supposed to do north of the Arctic Circle, where it remains dark for several months each each year? <laughs> Easy. Some tell us just calculate from the lowest and highest points of the sun. <laughs> Damn. This is, uh, That's what she said? This is documentation. In 1900, when Ellen White was confronted with certain problems relating to Sabbath keeping above the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. she wrote the following advice to G.A. Irwin, then president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. This is a quote. In the countries where there is no sunset for months, and again, no sunrise for months, the period of time will be calculated by the records kept. But God has a world large enough and proper and right for the human beings he has created to inhabit it without finding homes in those lands so objectionable in many, many ways. This is letter 167. Okay, am I right? She's planning to move all the uh, Eskimos to Hawaii. <laughs> They, they, they need to get people out of the out of air the darkness so they can keep the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> From Ellen G. White. One more real quick thing. I want to okay. This is Maxwell's summary. Okay. This is what he's saying all together. As Sunday Sabbatarianism rose in the church later on, Seventh-day Sabbath Sabbatarianism did express experience a brief revival. But by and large, the early church did not keep the Sabbath and was opposed to Sabbatarianism. Well, I think the evidence is clear, and uh, from those logical arguments mm -hmm. Carol was making, it uh, just backs it up even more. The fact is, no one can keep the letter of the law. So, it, really, the Sabbath day stuff all <laughs> comes down to keeping the commandments and stuff like we started the program with. Uh, and I like to, and, and I guess this comes back to the idea of salvation in Seventh Day Adventist Church that you do works to attain your own righteousness. So you can, I think, in earlier shows you showed Ellen G. White said that uh, we go in without a mediator. We have to stand with our own works to see if we can get in heaven or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to now tie this in with the remaining time we have in this program with the gospel. Uh, and go to this. I'm going to go to a chart now that I have on the wall here. And uh, we're going to look at a few things and tie this in with uh, works and keeping the commandments and all the rest of that. If you've got a Bible out there, you might want to grab that too just to check this verse. But it's on our chart. And I'll show it to you right now. It's uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and the verse, and, and the verse here reads, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So it's not by the works that we do, keeping the Sabbath, doing uh, uh, dietary laws and, and all the rest of it, but it's by God's mercy that He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Ghost. In other words, that being born from above, as Jesus is talking about in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Now, let me tie this in on this chart with what I have immediately underneath this with the, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The seal of God. Oh, the Sabbath. Now, now, in Seventh-day Adventism, are you saying the seal of God is keeping the Sabbath day? That's correct. The Sabbath is the testing truth. The Sabbath is the testing truth. So that's that's the proof that you have the seal of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's take a look at this chart and see what the Bible has to say about the seal of God. Looking in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, it says, In whom ye have also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is 
the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. And, uh, you know, we're running out of time here, but check also in cross-reference to this Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, which will tie in this, but it says, Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Looks to me like there's a different seal of God going on here <laughs> than what we're finding in Seventh-day Adventism. And if we look down here in the bottom of the chart, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 through 22, it says, Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. <laughs> we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. God of promise. It's all right here. And these references are, are right there in the Bible. You don't need Ellen G. White to tell you what the seal of God is in this case. Now, uh, from here, I'd like to go into a, a gospel message uh, on, on this. Just briefly, we're running out of time rapidly. But uh, I'm going to say a few words here, and then uh, let Wallace get back in it as we close out the show, because uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, Basically, the Seventh-day Adventist church teaches work salvation. This is another gospel, as we'll find in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, the Bible says salvation is by grace. One, first of all, all men in all ages are lawbreakers. They're sinners, Romans 3.23. No man was ever saved by law-keeping. That's Romans 3.28, Galatians 2.16. Uh, for the simple reason that no man ever was a law keeper. Number three, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness in every age to everyone who believes. And we have plenty of scripture references to, to support that. Romans 10.4, I think you've already mentioned a few times. Uh, other examples, before the, 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 before in uh, the Old Testament times, uh, before Moses, Abraham uh, was saved by grace. Romans 4. Under Moses, David was saved by grace. Romans 4. In Christ's time, the thief on the cross, Luke chapter 23. Uh, and since Christ, Paul, saved by grace, Philippians 1 through 9. And as this last part of the chart says, works cannot save you. As it says here, works cannot save you, Ephesians 2 8. Uh, we have plenty of scripture references here. If you're taping this, it's about the only way we're going to get it because we're running out of time rapidly. Uh, works cannot judicially justify you. There's the references. Uh, works cannot forgive sin. Works. Uh, cannot receive the Spirit. Works cannot elect you to salvation. Works cannot fulfill the law. Works cannot call you. Works cannot regenerate you. Works cannot obtain faith. And works cannot keep one saved. 1 Corinthians 3.15. Uh, these, these references here make it clear that works are not going to do it. Sabbath keeping and all the rest of it. Now, uh, time's just about up. I want to uh, mention a couple of br brief points. First of all, uh, at the beginning of this series, we did uh, we, we showed a chart. We don't have time to show it to you now. Of a, a bunch of questions of patterns in the cults, and we were looking through this series to see if Seventh Day Adventism falls into the category of a cult. And I think it's safe to say, I'm sure Wallace and uh, Carol, you would agree, that on every point, Seventh Day Adventism falls right in line, even to Galatians chapter one, verses six through nine. Check that out about preaching another gospel. They fall in line with a very clear definition of what a cult is. Uh, and so as this series winds down, I wanted to get that in as we're getting ready to close down the show. Uh, but uh, Wallace, I'd like you with these remaining moments to say something from your heart, preach the gospel a little <laughs> bit, and uh, we'll wrap things up. Carol uh, and I underwent a lot of pain as we were leaving Adventism to find that everything you've been taught your entire life uh, is coming from deceit is quite an experience and a lot of indecision and so forth. Carol worked uh, to handle a lot of this pain by writing a little book which uh, she has with her called Cutting the White Tie. And one of the ways she handled this was by writing uh, some poetry. She has a short poem I think that sums it up quite well. And so I'll, I've asked her to read this poem to you. The name of the poem is Where's the Lord? Attended an SDA church heard nothing about the Lord. All I heard was Ellen G. White, the history of how she scored. Could feel her presence around me. Seemed I was wrapped in a shroud. Couldn't escape this haunting fear. To Ellen White they all bowed. She's the spirit of prophecy, one whom the Lord has endowed. 
Praise, praise your name, O oh dear Ellen. We'll read your books, they all vowed. The life within me grew weaker. Christ blotted out by her face. Where have they buried my Jesus? Why can't he be in this place? Carol and I uh, can tell you that leaving Adventism is a wrenching process. It was painful. And everyone we've known who's done this, leaving the Adventism for the gospel, tells us the same thing. It was a painful, wrenching process. But you know something? Not one of the people we've ever known to leave Adventism for the gospel has ever gone back or even shown the slightest interest in coming back. So I'd like to inv invite you to experience the free forgiveness that Jesus Christ uh, offers and the pleasure and freedom of living within the gospel. Praise God. Well, we're going to sign the show off now. I just want to go out with this uh, thought for you out of the, the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 30. And uh, it's the Philippian jailer, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 31 it says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. It didn't say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and keep the seventh Sabbath day, or keep the dietary laws, or any of this kind of stuff. It said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Put your trust in Christ, in Him alone. And through the seal of God, the precious Holy Spirit, you can have that faith and joy that leads to everlasting life in the shed blood of Christ. Well, thank you for joining us in this series. Uh, we wish we had more time, but we don't. So, uh, thank you. Uh, may the Lord be with you always. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to write or call us, and we'll try to provide you with any information we can to help you in whatever way you might need it. God bless. Bye-bye. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 